Hi there and welcome to a new episode of Impact Talks. Today we have Sats with us. He's the former executive director of communications and marketing of the WWF. It's also our first time to have a charity with us. Of course, we also had UNICEF as a speaker, uh, but on Impact Talks as a podcast, it's a great thing to have WWF with us and hopefully many more charities to come. A uh, very interesting background as well as very entrepreneurial. So without further ado, I would love for you to take the floor, introduce yourself and uh, what you're doing. Um, yeah, what you've done and what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I am uh, privileged to be on your show. So I have just concluded 11 years with, uh, the, with WWF International here in Switzerland. Uh, and I looked after communications and marketing as part of the global senior management team uh, working with the director general. So as, as you or your listeners may know, WWF is an international uh, not non-governmental organization. We have about 7,000 people and are spread out across 100 countries. Uh, and my role was to be able to drive the marketing and communications agenda in line with the conservation agenda across these 100 offices. So that was what kept me busy over the last 11 years or so. Uh, and uh, within that, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's really about how conservation and how uh, the engagement with people is actually changing. How do you bring people into the agenda? How do you bring people into the into the, the movement, so to speak? And therein, sort of, I was able to tap into my entrepreneurial roots, which is essentially where I came from, uh, because I came to the WWF from a, an, an internet entrepreneurial venture called Soundbuzz, which I had set up in Singapore together with a few partners. And that was in the digital music uh, era, if you will. It was digital music 1.0. And this was the time, the heady days of, uh, of Napster and MP3 music. And we went through a whole decade of 10 years of watching the industry and helping it to evolve as it went from from the, the humble ringtone to the mighty streaming, uh, you know, catalogs. So it was, that was a real entrepreneurial link that I had to my role at WWF. And prior to that was uh, in television, which is, which sort of seems outdated now, even though TV still has its role, I believe. Uh, but in those days, cable television was, was very new in those parts uh, 20, 25 years ago. And I had the privilege of working to set up two brilliant brands. One of them was Star Television in uh, Hong Kong, and the other was MTV Asia, based out of Singapore for Southeast Asia and for India. So that's sort of my, what I would call my non-linear career in three very different industries over 30 years, a decade at a time. So I always want to revert it back, especially having the head um, global of uh, communications and marketing. To me, uh, I've worked in the past with some corporates um, on communications and it always strikes me that the people in charge of the marketing are extremely creative or know how to manage extremely creative people. Um, so in some way, it surprises me that you come from the music industry, but in some other ways it doesn't. But still, what do you think the parallels were between music uh, or like having a startup within the music industry and then going into a marketing role. Right. So I think that there's there's one very uh, deep common uh, link, and that's really the audience, and that's really people. And and for me, marketing and communications is really about connecting and about creating demand. And those are the two fundamentals that whether, whether I was working in a music uh, industry or in, uh, or in television or at WWF, the idea here is how do you identify, how do you segment the people that you need to work with or you want to connect to and how do you talk to them? How do you engage with them? How do you get them to participate with you? Uh, in that particular area. And that's really the common link. So you can strip away the, the industries because the industries are 
you know, our ecosystems and functional pieces that you need to learn about. But when it comes to people, because it's the same person, it's you who would be watching television, it's you who would be also uh, listening to streaming music, and it's you who would probably, you know, maybe supporting a cause for a charity. So it's really about what are those specific um, relevance points, relevant points that I can actually engage with you on to trigger these different aspects. I want to go deeper, obviously, into how you do everything, but that's probably for later because um, I kind of like it when it's a bit more chronological. Obviously, we jump here and there. But going back to like your childhood, um, did you know you were going to go where you are today? Were there indications? How was your, yeah, how was your childhood like? How was your studies? Um, can you tell us more? Right. The, uh, I would, well, I, I think that if I look back at my childhood, I certainly had no idea which way, you know, life would sort of unfold. Uh, I grew up in, in, a, in, an, in the eastern part of, of India, in a, in a city called Calcutta, where I did most of my schooling. Uh, before that, I, was, I had been born on the tea estates of Assam, which is in northeast India. So it was really quite far away from everywhere that we're talking about today. Um, and I lived all of my secondary schooling life in one city, uh, in one school. So it was as, as stable as it could get. And I think that that was, that was brilliant. But there was no... And, it, you know, India was at a very early stage of its development. It was just coming out of independence. It was coming out of its uh, change from the Soviet model. And it was, uh, it was a long time uh, before it actually hit mo modernization in the 90s. So I was at a point where it was, um, you know, it was really a question like in most Indian homes of, of doing the right thing, going to a good school, getting yourself a decent result, going to a good college, and, and you know, then trying to figure out what are the, what are the job opportunities more than career, what are the job opportunities that exist out there? Now, fortunately, at the end of my um, at the end of my college degree, I went to management school, and I was fortunate to to be taken into an elite management school. At that place, that was where I started formulating in my mind that what I really do like and what I really do well is around communications, and that needs to be at the basis of what I do next. What, why did you I, why did you think that that was the what sparked it? I think it was really about when we started working on projects within the management school, you know, you, you needed to devise a project or you needed to analyze a situation and then you needed to stand up and present it. You needed to, you know, uh, orchestrate a certain presentation with other team members. Uh, you needed to actually pull together and write out the, the uh, case as you saw it. And I found that I was able to do that uh, in a way that made it quite simple for people to understand and appreciate. So that sort of started forming the foundation of what I wanted to do. And, and from management school, I then went into advertising at J. Walter Thompson. And uh, that, was, that was my obsession at that point that, yes, okay, this communications thing is really deep for me. I want to go in and learn more about it. And I spent a good five years in, in an advertising agency, just understanding how they deconstruct uh, you know, consumers, how they deconstruct products to get to the core message in terms of being able to get it out there. So that was really the genesis of it, more at towards the latter part of my, my education rather than at the earlier part of my schooling. So, so the management school, I'm assuming, is after high school, right? It's like a That's, bachelor's It's actually bachelor's. after my bachelor's degree. So oh, it's after, it was bachelor's after bachelor's. university. And you said you got into the elite um, management school. I'm assuming it's tough to get in. How come you got in, you think? Was it your grades? Was it you worked hard, ate your vegetables? What was it? <laughs> I think I was just terribly lucky. Uh, to be honest with you, it's it's one of those things that, you know, you've got hundreds, hundred thousand people and, you know, there's going to be a thousand people taken in and uh, you just need, it, it's a very intense set of examinations to, to get to the interview stage and then it's a very intense <laughs> interview to get through. 
so I think that uh, sometimes the stars align and that's all that I want to think about that something aligned and I, I was able to get through. But to be fair that most of the things in India are, you know, they're geared or skewed more towards uh, the, the scientific and the mathematical side of things rather than the creative and the arts. And I think that that was something that we needed to keep in mind because I did my bachelor's in mathematics and that was my that was my grounding. So that gave you a very logical way of thinking through things. And uh, I think that that may have come into play in all those examinations and all which tend to be a bit unfairly tend to be much more uh, logic and math and science related rather than uh, creativity. So pretty much if you have a bachelor in maths, you can go many. You were actually not the first one on the podcast who had a bachelor in maths. Um, ah, okay. So right. it's very interesting. But okay, so you're getting into school. After the school finishes, you joined an advertising agency, you said? That is correct. Can you tell us more about how you, st how old were you at this point? So this is, uh, I was 23 years old when I finished my MBA and uh, we had the, the luxury and the privilege of, of many organizations coming to the campus to actually recruit from, from uh, the, the graduating batch. And so I was fortunate to be able to get a job with an organization that I wanted. And uh, you know, three months later, I was starting with them in a completely different city. Uh, and starting my life in the in the big bad world of communications and that I think laid the foundation for a lot of the work that I did over the next 30 years in terms of uh, you know how pretty in-depth communications uh, marketing advertising and engagement can I ask which company it was is it famous or not very this was J. Walter Thompson. So J. Walter Thompson, actually, I'm, I'm a little bit less connected with the advertising scenario today than I was at that time. But uh, J. Walter Thompson was one of the premier advertising agencies in, in the world. And it was certainly one of, it was the largest uh, advertising agency in India. So if somebody did want to go down that route, this was a prime uh, job to get. And I was lucky enough to get that. So you said you learned a lot that pretty much set the foundation, which means probably uh, necessary to explore. What can you give practical stories, examples of aha moments that you had, things that you realized that pretty much set the foundation for you? Yeah, I, you know, I think that um, I think that there are two sides to the communication story and to the advertising story. And I think you mentioned it a little bit earlier, Lova and you talked about the creativity because there's the creativity at one side of it and, and everybody remembers, you know, whether it be a, a clever piece of communication or a clever piece of advertising that appeals to you and it sticks. But at the end of it, at the base of it is really a lot of mathematics and, and people forget that because what it does come down to is how are you looking at uh, audiences? How are you being able to uh, dissect the audiences, analyze the audiences as to what are the criteria that are, you know, going to, uh, that are important to that particular audience and what is the demographic, what's the psychographic of that audience that you're trying to get at. And if you can sort of make all of that simple and have a brilliant message that comes through, that's all what people need to remember. So it is actually a fine balance between the the data and the output, which is the creative output. So I like that. I like that balance. Uh, and, and I think that those two things, uh, one is seen and one is not, because you only see the creative side. You don't necessarily see the boring mathematical side. Uh, but for me, both are super exciting right to this date. Yeah. So do you have examples like stories? Well, you can, uh, if you... <laughs> Funnily enough, one of the first products that I worked on, and, and it's ironic that I'm talking about it because it was on hair care. Um, and uh, I, I used to work on, on the hair care business for, with Unilever. And Unilever had a, uh, you know, a massive market in India to, to, to work with. It was mostly targeted at, at women uh, in terms of the hair care market. But how we actually then um, 
worked with the teams there to to analyze the market as to you know are we look talking about the ultra urban person are we talking about the second tier cities are we talking about third tier cities what are the kind of products that we get in there are they you know shampoos and shampoos with conditioner or shampoos with separate conditioner you know again it varied depending on the kind of the market you were talking to to the kind of infrastructure people had available and then the sizing of the market how big was this market how many players would it take to create this market and therefore what was the share that you were looking to get within that marketplace so all of these factors came together in in actually crafting the the core strategy and the communications and advertising strategy uh which is probably my earliest memory of working on on a strategic document uh with with and then implementing it so it wasn't just about a piece of paper but then taking it to fruition and taking it all the way to the launch of you know three three brands within that uh, hair care industry um which was uh, which was just absolutely fascinating to watch for a fresh for a newbie coming out of management school and suddenly you're doing the stuff that you hear about in management school that you will be doing this and here you are doing it that's uh, tremendous and that was the part that involved both the math and the art you know so both things coming together so how are you gathering the data because this is not like this is pre facebook google that's correct era. so how are you how yeah tell me so you know this is this is actually that's a fantastic question because it's amazing how so many great marketing stories and so many great marketing authors like the philip kotlers of the world date back to 30 40 years ago and they all worked with a lot of data and you wonder in in a world of pre facebook and pre digital pre social media pre internet how did all this data come about and what i think that the part that everybody forgets is that a lot of these organizations have astonishing numbers of people on the ground because they have huge distribution networks and those distribution networks you can have 10 20 30 000 data points coming back to you from the ground so these are people who are actually in those geographies selling those products talking to retailers talking to people and those data points come back to you in a bit of a sometimes unorganized fashion but this is real data coming to you it may not be exactly real time because it takes some time for it to come together but then people's you know attitudes weren't shifting as probably as rapidly as they are today so you were able to actually work with data just maybe not in real time but then you were also in a position where you could then shape how people were were consuming products you know you were you were creating needs rather than the way brands in in developed countries today you're actually talking about how people participate and shape brands over here it was you know 30 years ago it was how brands were shaping needs rather than the other way around and i think that that shift has been quite uh, fascinating to watch so how would you explain that shift do you think because of social media everything started changing how did the change happen like from your perspective how did the change happen and what were you seeing that was changing in daily activities i you know i think that there's been a i i think that the last 10 to 15 years has seen a tremendous shift in the way people viewed brands and engaged with them and i think that even when you were actually creating a new category like we were when we were doing digital music with soundbuzz at that point in time we were filling a market need that there was a need for digital music there was no official way to get it and therefore we were it was more functional uh, and then the brand sort of rode on that and people were were trying to figure out as to how do i make this work on my phone and on my computer etc so it was still fulfilling a need but i think that as social media came in and as people started talking to other people and i think it was the formation of communities that these virtual communities started forming because you then started talking to like minded people that you never actually did other than just your friends 
I mean, you had friends and, you know, you all enjoyed the same beer or the same ice cream or whatever. And, and you know, you, that was your circle. And, and the largest, the, the extended circle would be if you were all standing in a pub and, you know, you were looking at other people drinking that, but you had very little interaction with them. Now, suddenly you were in a, in a social media environment where not only were your friends connected with you, but you were able to hear and hear, see and listen to live and also engage in real time with people who were like minded, who had the same interests as you did. And they were anywhere between San Francisco and Tokyo. And you were able to have this conversation. So I think that the creation of that community allowed for a lot richer discussion to start happening about brands and how they, you know, how they identified with brands and how they could actually contribute to brands. It was no longer one way. It wasn't about a marketer saying, this is the brand and this is the message, you know, take it or leave it kind of thing. And this process, which is, I think it's still evolving. I don't think we're there yet. People are still getting used to the idea that the traditional brand and communications model is not one way, it's two way. And I think that that is something that we are seeing evolving right now. So it's a good time to be in that business or to be in that uh, sort of uh, moment. So from your perspective, um, if I'm understanding correctly, what you're noticing is definitely marketing has a huge part in data gathering. And that cycle has um, of obviously gathering the data and it arriving, uh, it's become more organized and faster as well. That is, that is exactly right. And it's, it's, it's in real time. But it's also, it's not just the marketer being able to gather the data, but it's also the marketer being able to have this conversation because yeah. the consumer is now participating with the brand. And it's no longer just a, you know, the, the, a brand in headlights, but it's a brand, um, let's say for want of a better term, it's a, it's a part, it's an experience. It's a brand experience. Yeah. You know, how do you live the brand rather than just consume it? Cool. Uh, okay. So uh, one more question about the time in your advertising agency, any other stories that you had aha moments? Well, uh, I, <laughs> there, there were a couple of, I mean, I, uh, most of my time was spent on that basic business that I spoke about. But there were a couple of other interesting ones, which was, um, uh, I think one of them was related to the, to the onset of, of the two-wheeler industry, because the two-wheeler industry in India, which was motorcycles and scooters, was a very archaic industry. It was, you know, it, it was the uh, old version of the Vespa, which had been sort of uh, Indianized and that the Bajaj was sort of the, the, the be all and end all of two-wheelers. In the, in the Indian uh, two-wheeler market. And uh, this was the, the onset of, of the Japanese coming in with Honda and, and uh, Honda had this tie up with the, the largest two-wheeler in India was the bicycle. So it was Honda coming in to tie in with Hero, which was the largest bicycle manufacturer. I believe they're still the largest bicycle manufacturer on the planet uh, as a single brand. And Hero Honda got together to create this, this uh, style of motorcycle, which was only a 100cc bike or 150cc bike, which was tiny compared to things you see on the road everywhere. But that sort of revolutionized the Indian two-wheeler industry. And I was fortunate to be part of that because I was working on that account. And how do you give, you know, how do you introduce a category like this and how do you actually create the brand differentiation because others will follow and others did, but it was quite an, an eye opening moment. So it was really at the beginning of that product curve that you were able to, uh, you know, bring about again, the same math and the same art that how do you analyze the market and segment it and how do you create some really fantastic advertising that, that gets people into like, I, m I must have one. Or so, I want to have one. So what did you guys do then? Because you, you're saying, obviously, how do you revolution? Pretty much what you're saying is how do you revolutionize a market, which I think is super relevant to some of the startups who are introducing new products, especially now the new trend being electricity. So what did you guys do to obviously shift the thinking 
in India from going to bicycles to these 100cc motorcycle bicycles? Well, so it was really a question of trying to figure out as to who did we want to target and with what kind of product. So within the range of motorcycles, there was the the very flashy end, which which uh, you know was sleekly designed and had a lot of bells and whistles, and then there was the more workhorse end. In in essence, they were essentially the same, but uh, you know they were just they had a different look and a different image to it. And therefore, for one, it was we we uh, looked at the people who were looking at uh, fuel efficiency because money was important to them. And therefore, it was marketed to a very large audience at the base of the pyramid as a, the most fuel efficient vehicle that you could get. And, and as you looked at the emerging uh, designs at the top end, it was really for the younger, uh, probably urban, slightly more upper, upper middle uh, audience that could afford it. I mean, the core, it was still very economical because it was the same engine, but it was now a different design and you were able to market something much flashier. So again, you learned a lot about market segmentation, even though the core product may have been the same. But how does what role does communications and advertising play in in a, in a, in consumer choices? Yeah. I mean, I've run a lot of campaigns, so I understand what you mean with market segmentation, but I can still think, I think that from my perspective, my market segmentation, the way I interpret it might be a little bit different. Obviously, if you're talking about a whole, um, like a huge country, uh, not like the Netherlands. So how would you uh, do market segmentation was it like on Facebook where you have 25 to 30 year olds and then that's who we're targeting. And so we usually create an avatar and then we're speaking to this avatar and pretty much creating a product that sells to this avatar. Right. Is that kind of how you did it or how, how would market segmentation work with you? So quite different, right? Because there wasn't that level of data. OK, so even though we had multiple data points, you're still talking about a country that was, you know, just shy of a billion people at that time. It's one point three billion now. But at that, so what you do is that you actually sample sample. So you have a sample of a certain segment within that 20, you know, 35 to 45 age group who wants an economic, uh, you know, option for for transport. So it's, it's a functional use with a low cost use, right? And, and then you actually work with that audience and you do uh, simple focus groups, you, you market in one city. That's another thing that you rarely see nowadays is that we used to have this concept of pilot markets. So we would take one or two small cities where you would then just launch it in that city and advertise it with that message in that city to see what the take up was and then extrapolate those learnings to the other parts of the country and then launch it on a broader basis. Now, in those days, remember, when you released an ad in city A, for example, right, let's take a small city that used to be a great test city in India called Pune on the western coast of India. Why was it a good test city? Sorry? Why was it a good test city? Well, because it was sort of like a microcosm of many parts of the country and it was a contained, you know, place in terms of it had a good reflection of the entire country. So it was a good place to test something that and another city called Bangalore, which were the typical two cities where things would get tested. But in those days, if you released an ad campaign in that city and tested it, there was no social media, there was no internet. So the stuff would not spill. So it would stay. What, what happens in Bangalore stays in Bangalore, literally. And, you know, you could do something right. You could do something wrong and nobody would mind and nobody would care because when you launched it in the next city, they would not have no idea of what had happened in the first city. Now, today you can't do that because as soon as you release it in the smallest town in the Netherlands, you know, everybody is going to know as to what ABC brand or ABC car or motorcycle is doing uh, and it'll go global not only in the Netherlands it'll glow, go everywhere if it's a global brand but you could do this so there was this concept of test marketing which is actually now I'm, I'm not even sure if that's a thing anymore 
but so <laughs> it's so what's the equivalent now in modern days how do how do companies test then if it's not i, I think it's really looking at uh yeah. You may still do some tests, but I think a lot of it is done through conversations and engagement with uh, with your audiences. And a lot of it happens on social media, which could not happen earlier. Right. So, so that was the data data equivalent of that day. So the equivalent of test marketing would be a small closed off community, for instance, like our audience right now. And then we take a small segment out of that audience and we just have conversations with them on a more one on one thing. Yeah, or uh, even in a small group or, you know, whatever, whatever works for that particular situation. But it's easy for you to get people because it's not that simple when you have to do it physically. But if you have to do it virtually, you could you could probably have multiple groups quite easily. Yeah, true. OK, cool. So let's proceed then. We, we stayed quite a while in the advertising um, agency. So what what happens next and when did you know you had to take the next step? Well, the next step was really, uh, I think that that's where the entrepreneurial sort of um, bug kicked in, if you will. Because right now you're still uh, living in India because... No, no, it, no. I, so right now you're in Switzerland, but uh, in the point of the story, um, you are still in India, right? Well, I at this moment, I'm in India and I'm just about to leave uh, because that's where the... the you know, when I'd spent those five years in advertising, I learned a lot and I'm grateful for that. But what I did realize was that this is a legacy industry, that there are rules that you need to work with. And that's how the industry works. What's a, what does a legacy industry mean? Well, that means it's been around for a long time. It's got a certain set of, you know, how things are done. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's not that simple for it to change right to change that easily so if you really look at it most of the advertising agencies of yesterday are not really the digital agencies of today because they they were legacy industries they didn't really change that easily and i yeah. think that that was uh, what i was uh, referring to and i think that at that moment i was very keen to understand as to what would it mean if a new industry came about and there are no rules and there's no legacy how does that work? How do those rules come into play? And it was just very, very fortuitous that at that moment, uh, satellite television entered Asia and uh, it entered through the form of Star Television in Hong Kong. And uh, this was in 1991. And suddenly, you know, we were all used to across most of Asia, you know, the three or four state owned uh, television channels you know, you know, state owned television channels, not necessarily very, very interesting. You know, there used to be some one really good program that happened on Sunday evening at seven o'clock and everybody would sit around and watch it kind of thing. And that all seems like it was a different era. It, and it was. So at that moment, when Star TV announced that they were looking to, to launch and they were looking at, you know, markets around Asia, including India, I was really interested. So I was I managed to find my way to Hong Kong and I managed to find my way to talk to Star TV. And uh, before I knew it, I was I was in Star TV in Hong Kong and I was suddenly in the middle of this astonishing industry that I understood very little about. But it had obviously been quite successful in the US and in the and in parts of Europe. And here it was coming to the biggest continent or, or biggest you know, uh, area of the world. Uh, which which was just a fascinating moment for us to see what, what could be done. And for me, that was really, that's when I got the bug of working with new industries, working with disruptive technologies, working with, you know, um, radical changes in the landscape, because this is what it did. And suddenly we were talking to advertising agencies about buying time on something which was, you know, working 24 seven, multiple channels, totally different viewing habits from the seven o'clock Sunday evening kind of thing. And the kind of programming that you were able to access was suddenly global programming. Then you start creating programming reflective of global programming. You started talking to consumers, engaging consumers in a way uh, which was very different from, okay, tonight movie at 7 p.m., you know, be there or be square kind of thing. 
uh, and suddenly you were like, you know, the same show was visible, you know, three times, four times a week, etc. So a whole lot of changes, a whole lot of differences in the way you sold uh, space or sold time, how advertising agencies had to change to buy that time. Uh, and, and for me, that was just watching the birth of an industry. And I think that it was a very, very big moment in my career to actually see that happen because it then set the stage for the next two or three things that I did after that. I want to I wanna come back to what you said uh, just now. You said you managed to get yourself to Hong Kong. You managed yourself to get into the offices. So I am an entrepreneur and I've managed myself into many uh, opportunities and big clients that we had but it's never like managed. There's usually months of negotiation. There's like um, luck involved, some aha moments that happened. Uh, so uh, what do you mean with you managed? What did you exactly do? Well, you no, know, you're right. There's a whole backstory when it comes to managing your way into a different country, into a different office. Especially from India, I can imagine like, millions of people want to uh, go work abroad and and manage themselves into uh, so what 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 did you do well so i think it was a combination of you know the a real desire to actually work in this startup industry called satellite television that was one component the second was a component of uh, that you know this was still within reach you know singapore hong kong was still within reach of india as compared to if I wanted to go and do the same thing in New York City, it was just out of my thinking. And then the third was, you know, OK, I didn't know a lot of people, but I could network enough uh, with people who had worked with me in the past and who were working in different parts of the region, including in Hong Kong, who were able to, you know, uh, give me a phone number or, or put me in touch with someone so that I could actually network my way to the right person and get, uh, get, a, get a meeting or get a conversation. So you're right, it, there were a few, there were a couple of months of this sort of backstory happening at the moment when one of those conversations at Star TV said, well, if you were here, we could probably have a, a much deeper conversation about a, a role. Now, that was a risk element because they were not suggesting that, you know, we are, we are inviting you and flying you over for an interview and here's the role and job description. And they were just saying, if you were here, you know, we could have this conversation. So for me, it was that was the moment when I needed to take a gamble and say, OK, I need to go and be there. And if it works, brilliant. If it doesn't, I need to then figure out what's my second option. But at that point, I had no plan B. So I really just focused on that found my way, literally bought myself my last, with my last set of rupees, the, the ticket to Hong Kong, uh, got there, found a friend to stay with, because I could, there was nothing else I could, I could do other than I would have been on the street, and, uh, and had that fateful meeting. To the person's credit, I said, okay, I'm here. Am I going to get that conversation? And he said, oh, you're here. Of course, you're going to, I promised you. And we and that conversation then developed into two or three conversations with different people in the organization. The and, same uh, they, day, the same week or? Uh, no, it happened over about uh, over, I would say, about um, 10 days. Um, and but those 10 days were pretty intense because, uh, you know, for them, it was a, they were taking a meeting. For yeah. me, it was, you know, a question of life and. <laughs> but did you okay. get a one-way ticket or a t or a return ticket? No, I pretty much had a one-way actually. Uh, it, it, there was no plan B at that point in time. I said, if nothing, if that doesn't work, I'll figure out something else. And then, of course, if I had to, you know, return, I would return. I had no choice. But uh, I was quite determined that this was something that was far too good an opportunity to miss. So it was, I think, the combination of luck and determination is is a powerful combination so you networked within india to get in touch with some people in that industry yes. then the invitation came you took the risk and then so that's a high stakes uh, conversation which a lot of entrepreneurs have including myself 
Uh, what do you think you did in that um, conversation that got their attention? Well, it was really coming out. And it, this is where my background really helped me because they were essentially looking. And at that time, I didn't know, but it only revealed itself in the conversation was that they were essentially looking for uh, salespeople who were going to work with the advertising agencies in India uh, to sell airtime on, on the satellite television channels. Uh, and just by virtue of having been in the industry for five years, I was, I wouldn't say brilliantly connected, but at least I was aware of the, the advertising agency setup in India. And that became a, the cornerstone for what people, you know, for what they hired me for. Uh, so I was able to move into or transition into that role because a lot of my work, ironically, was actually in India. So I was actually working with the teams in Hong Kong, but selling time into the buyers in India. And so it, it gave me the opportunity to also travel back and forth between Hong Kong and India, uh, renew my or, you know, keep my contacts alive within the advertising space. I was just doing a different role now. And, um, and that's how I grew in that role. That was, so that's how they actually hired me. That was, that was the, they saw that relevant piece of my work, uh, that it was something I could bring to them. So, so how many years did you eventually spend there and what were the learning lessons from that time? So I spent uh, just over, uh, I think about three years in Hong Kong with, with Star TV and, um, and then subsequently moved with MTV to Singapore and that was, and then I spent another five years with them there. But in terms of um, the, so the, the, the role actually uh, sort of morphed quite quickly within, within Star TV in Hong Kong because I moved from being a salesperson to being a marketing person. They, I, was, I was then engaging audiences from Taiwan to India. And why we why did the transition happen from sales to marketing? Well, I think wow. that uh, essentially, again, once I had seen the sales side of it for a year and, and I understood what went into the sales of, or, I, and I think sales is something that people probably underestimate. So if I can just digress for a second there, Lova, what I would say is that in any industry, I would say that sales is an essential for people to appreciate what the ground feels like, because that's when you actually look to make the transaction and you take it to somebody and they're going to buy it or they're not going to buy it. And I think that that moment is a moment of truth for the individual until you get rejected you never understand how hard it is because it isn't about just creating an advert and putting it out there and saying, did people like it or not? No, it's about the transaction because even your advert is ultimately geared towards making a transaction happen. And, and at that point in time, so I, I think that the sales part of it is a really important thing. It, it grounds you, it teaches you, and it makes you humble. And, and I think that I tell all my, you know, when I'm mentoring students, etc. I tell them, do do a stint in sales. As much as you hate it, do it because you will come out the richer for it. And I came out the richer for it, but I did have my background in marketing and, and advertising in the agency, if you recall. And uh, when this opening happened in Star, it made a lot of sense for me to say, okay, I can bring in the learning of the sales in Star as well as my own advertising background and actually pitch the marketing role, which made complete sense to, to them and to me. So I then grew in that marketing role. Uh, within because the, there was no marketing before that? It was no, just, there was. Yeah. It was just that the opening took place, that there was, a, there was just the opportunity arose and I was able to take, uh, take a hold of it. And, uh, but that was quite important for me to actually enrich my marketing career because I had the sales side to go with it. And I think that without that, it would have been a little less uh, robust to, to say the least. So, so then you're getting into your marketing role, but I think yeah, shortly yeah. after you moved to MTV, right? Yes, that's right. So MTV was actually part of the Star TV network and, oh, okay. uh, and then MTV broke away for various political reasons and went and set up MTV Asia in Singapore. 
And at that point in time, uh, they recruited some people who were from STAR, some new people, but I was part of that team and we, we were then, I then moved to Singapore, uh, you know, with my, with my wife who had been in Hong Kong also working with me at that time, not at STAR, but in another organization. And uh, we, and I went into MTV as the head of marketing for Asia Pacific. Uh, and, and that was uh, where I really cut my teeth on, you know, genuine mass, mass marketing uh, with a global brand. Because if, at Star TV, we were talking about a brand new brand. It was new, nobody had heard of it, and we created it. With MTV, we were talking about a brand that had global resonance, and we were trying to adapt it to how would it look in Asia and did it have to look the same everywhere or not? And what's the difference, do you think, from a starting brand and then building that up to an MTV which you have to adapt? I think the, that's a good question. I think the, the thing about a starting brand was it had two functions. One was it was defining a new category. So satellite television was equivalent to Star TV because they were the first and they were the only in that category. So it had, it carried the onus of the category itself. So if somebody, uh, you know, criticized satellite television, they also criticized Star TV. So you carried the, 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 the can, so to speak, for the, the category. But the second was that you also had the ability to create it organically. That, you know, what, what did you want need it to be? What was relevant? You know, you, you didn't have to actually adhere to any rules that existed because there weren't any rules. Uh, there wasn't a brand, it was brand new. So you could actually make it fit uh, in terms of it being the, you know, the alternative to state television or the true meaning of entertainment or 24 seven entertainment. So you could do whatever you wanted with that brand. Uh, and, and that's really where it became a, uh, an interesting proposition for me. And that was very entrepreneurial because you were dealing with a disruptive technology you were dealing with a very disruptive television moment and uh, you were creating a brand at the same time. Compared to an MTV situation where you had a brand that had been launched in 1981, we were now in 1995, and you know, 14 years the brand had, was, was at its peak in the US and in many parts of the world. It was just starting out in Asia, in, well not really, but early stages, and you were still, you needed to work within a framework. Right? So there was a framework that you needed to operate within. Um, and um, that's the big difference. And this was much more defined. It was a music television product as compared to a star television network, which was a bouquet of channels. And uh, you know, there were certain rules that existed around the MTV brand that you know, we eventually we had the ability to interpret it at a local level. Uh, but uh, it took some time and it what, you know, what do you mean with eventually you had the opportunity well the thing is that you know in many in many cases and there's nothing wrong with that but in some you know you have big global brands coming out of the US which are which sort of follow the mantra of uh, think global act global right now there's nothing wrong with that but, you know, and then there was all this talk in those times in the 90s of, you know, thinking global, acting local, blah, 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 blah. And, and it took us some time to actually get to a position where you had to keep the global framework of MTV in mind, but you, had, but you were able to execute it locally in each of the countries that we operated in as compared to a uniform size that fit all and say that, okay, this is the MTV product. This is what you're going to get regardless. And I think that was where we started, but that was not where we finished. Uh, and I think that that was again, again, a result of understanding the data. It was understanding the market. What is it that people buy? Why do they buy that? Who are these people who buy that? What are the genres of music that sell? What are the languages that dominate in each of these markets? If everybody is, buying you know heaps of uh, Bollywood music, how much uh, hip hop are you actually going to sell in that market? What is the relevance of showing you know 80% of your channel on hip hop if 80%, 95% of the market is listening to Bollywood? You know, so how could you bring those two things um, into contrast and say, all right, we've got the product mix wrong. 
we need to fix it. How do we fix it? Use the data, use the learning, go out and listen, go out and learn. I so, look at the television ratings for the same music on other channels. So, for, so if I'm hearing you correctly, that means that pretty much the hypes of um, the 90s, the 80s, all of that wasn't really set by the artists. It was almost set by the marketers because like if the audience doesn't like hip hop people, then that means MTV Asia wasn't streaming hip hop in the 90s. So my entire childhood was hip hop. But in Asia, it was Bollywood. That's right. In, well, in India, and it was different in Indonesia, and it was different in Taiwan, and it was different in Korea. And that was the whole thing that, you know, the, as somebody much wiser than me put it at that time, it was that, does the MTV burger have to taste the same everywhere, right? <laughs> and and, uh, and I, that stayed with me because it was such a powerful, uh, you know, visual that uh, is it is it actually the same burger everywhere and as it turns out it isn't uh, and that helped us a lot in in building a very powerful relevant locally grounded brand but it built it laddered up to a strong mtv at the end of the day globally you know mtv was in whatever 150 countries and it was strong in these countries because it was relevant in each country it wasn't just about thinking global and acting global. But so how would you, where's the limits? Like how local should the MTV burger go? Like when do you know what the limit is? I think the, I think the issue is what, is what is it that you take off the core? What's the core value of a brand? So it comes back to the marketing. So if MTV is supposed to be the voice of the youth, I'm just sort of simplifying it here, yeah. then the voice of the youth is the core essence of the brand. And that core essence needs to reflect what the voice of the youth is in India versus the voice of the youth in London versus the voice of the youth in Tokyo. And so we're talking then country segmentation, not city segmentation. Okay. Right. Because then it starts getting very difficult to, to go down, you know, what's the greatest level you can go down to. But yes, you, you know, you, we did start playing with regional music, etc., in India really? and in certain parts of Asia, but, but you couldn't do a full channel because the economics were not viable. Okay. But, so that's the limit then. Yeah, exactly. So you have to define a limit and then that's where the financials uh, sort of come in, right? So you bring in audiences, financials and creativity and the three of them, you know, are strange bedfellows and eventually you need to come to, a, to an equilibrium where all three can reside together. But I mean, now I'm starting to understand like what you're saying about your math background and how relevant it is because when you talk about market segmentation, it's almost kind of crucial to have some type of like maths or statistics background just to be able to know are the economics good enough on the regional? Should we have an MTV channel, for instance? Like these questions can only be answered if you have enough data and you can actually interpret the data. Yeah, but I wouldn't know if it's crucial, but I would say that it helps. Yeah. Uh, it certainly helps to, to have that kind of an approach to it. Uh, you could approach it in in a few different ways, I think. But I just find that the, I I just find that I suppose like all nerdy mathematicians, you know, people feel underrated or underserved by by marketers, and it is actually a very because ultimately market research and actually today, uh, Loba, it's even more important than then or as important because today the amount of data that we see is staggering. Yeah. Right? right. We never had this level of data. And today, if you're not a data driven marketeer, you're just an opinion driven marketeer. And that is no good because ultimately an algorithm could do the work better than you. True. True. Wow. Interesting. OK, so you're joining MTV. Um, I saw that you joined as vice president right away. Um, are you living at this point in Hong Kong or in India back? So I've now moved to Singapore. So I moved, okay. so MTV was set up in Singapore. So I moved from Hong Kong to Singapore. Why Singapore? Why did they choose that? Uh, I think for a couple of different reasons. One was uh, 
you know, they were looking at uh, the, the um, I think there was a little bit of uncertainty as to what was going to happen in Hong Kong in 97 with the handover. So people were not sure as to, you know, what was the long term prospect in Hong Kong. Uh, Singapore was very aggressive as a country wooing the television industry. And today, Singapore is the center of the television industry for the Asia Pacific. And this was part of their drive to bring people in with incentives, with technology, with you know space, etc. And I think that that played a big role with MTV in, in the 90s, early 90s, to bring them there. And therefore, we were set up there and it was a, it was a great move. I mean, come, we didn't think about it that much at that time, but it was a very fortunate move because uh, today I'm a Singapore citizen, partly because I lived there at that time and you know, I'm proud to be an adopted son of Singapore. Uh, so it's a, it, was a, it was a great moment for my wife and myself when we moved to Singapore. So, okay, so you start off there because you went from vice president to eventually managing director, right? Right. So, so what happened was that I was looking after communications, marketing and research for MTV. And I think that I don't want to uh, put too fine a point on it, but the research was really important at that stage in, in the growth of MTV. Uh, so while we were doing great stuff on marketing, etc., the analysis was equally important. And therefore, I spent a fair bit of time doing the research. And then the opportunity came for, uh, there was a bit of an upheaval. As soon as we were setting up MTV India, something went wrong. Uh, and uh, we had a management uh, situation, uh, which uh, my, my president then said, why don't you do it for now? I just need somebody with a safe pair of hands to run this because we have a crisis. And um, it actually was quite a, situation because I was in India when the, the, the meltdown happened and my president asked me to do it while I was there and he said I'm going back you need to stay on and fix this uh, see you later back at the ranch sometime in the next few months because what's the, what's the difference in tasks then between a managing director and then your previous role because I'm assuming suddenly you're also operational Yes, because I was, well, I still had both roles. That was the interesting part. So I had to continue oh. with my other role as well. Did you well. have both the salaries? Of then? course not. It never works like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, so operating a, a country is a very different proposition, right? Because then you're talking about licensing, you know, where's your music product coming from? You're talking about programming. How are you creating the programming, the infrastructure required to do that? You know, where do, how does the regulation work? You know, are you in line with the regulation, regulatory framework for television and satellite television? Uh, you're suddenly required to hire across different disciplines, not just marketing and communications. So it just changes the whole thing on its side. Uh, and uh, that was an amazing, that was my entry into general management. And I'm uh, very, very uh, grateful for that opportunity because it happened you know, without much thought and it happened without much planning. And I just had to learn it literally on the fly. But it was right. isn't powerful. that isn't that so to me, it's always been leadership um, comes from obviously being the hardest working, being the one that has the most experience. But it, it seems so strange for me to go from just focusing on the marketing, the message, the research, and then suddenly dealing with pretty much everything um isn't that i can imagine you had long working days very yes i mean each day was like five days right i mean how was... did you deal with that what did you do to get through it when did it finally click for you i think the the you know the excitement of setting up something new the the energy that comes with it is uh is pretty magical and at that moment you know mtv was a really well you know high profile brand so people were you know it was in the news people were looking at it people were talking to you uh, so you were able to get access to a lot of you know different uh, stakeholders quite easily uh, and it uh, the energy behind that and then recruiting the team and i was able to uh, you know the, the the person who i eventually managed to recruit who became the on ground head of the office was a very close contact of mine who, who, you know, we hit it off really well. 
and uh, we were then uh, really operating a brilliant operation once we had set it up in India. So the excitement around that just keeps you going and it catches up with you later in life. But then, you know, we'll figure that out later. Uh, but yeah, you're doing, you know, what do you, what do you mean it catches up with well, you? Well, at some point in time, you know, you, you, you realize you need to take a break, right? And, and this is, you never need to take a break because of one bad week. You need to take a break because of 25 years of absolutely crazy styles of working. That's, uh, yeah, one of my passions is definitely um, giving that work-life balance message to um, younger entrepreneurs that are just starting. Yes. Um, obviously, being a bit six years now into everything, which is six years more than a beginning startup. Um, when do you think it's like time to take a break? How do you know you're coming close to like doing too much? Um, maybe a bit derailed now, but maybe a, uh, something I want to, I want your opinion on. Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, I, I, I had to take a break last year actually. So, but I think, you know, the fact that you share that with younger people is a really, um, is a is a commendable uh, thing because it's something that when you're young, when you're in your 20s, 30s, even early 40s, you're pretty invincible and you think that you can keep going like this forever. But it is taking a toll on your body and on your mind and uh, you don't realize it and it's cumulative and it just at some point in time it comes together and it says, okay, stop because you just at that point you're full and you can't think and you don't have the energy and it manifests its way in, you know, either a sickness or in an illness or back trouble or all kinds of other ailments, which you can't explain. And that's when you realize, okay, it's time for a break, but you don't need to get to that stage. You can take care of it as you go. So that like what you said, if you maintain a certain balance and you maintain a certain set of interests, so you, you know, you free your mind other than work, you know, re regularly, you have other interests, you have other hobbies, you, you do that. And I think that that's, that's something I, I can tell you that my wife always told me that, you know, I'm going to burn myself out if I didn't do that. And uh, lo and behold, she was right again. How did you, how did you know you got burned? Like what happened? Can you uh, share a little bit more so that we understand? Sure. Okay. So this was a year and a half ago and I basically, uh, you know, I'd been traveling a lot. I'd been, uh, you know, over several years at WWF. It, it's taken because it was a global role. I was on the road a lot. I was training offices. I was working in different geographies. Um, time zones meant nothing. I was working till, you know, I was averaging very few hours of sleep a night. And uh, it, it finally just manifested in my back. And, and, you know, I had a whole set of back issues. And I just didn't have the energy. So from going from having, and I used to always be uh, congratulated and envied for having more energy than the 30 year old in the office, suddenly I didn't and I couldn't understand what had happened. And, and I realized that, you know, this concept of a burnout is a real thing. It's not a, it's not an excuse. It's not a, it's not a figment of your imagination it is something that can happen to anybody. And, and honestly, if it could happen to me, it can happen to anybody because I never would have believed it. Uh, and my team couldn't believe it, that this had actually happened to me. How did, how did your team react? And like, how did you bring over the message? Because it's so hard to explain what a burnout yeah, is. Well, I was just very transparent and honest about it. And I said, look, I've had a series of back issues. And as I learned now, it isn't a it is a physical manifestation of a burnout. It isn't, you know, I didn't pretend that this was, I've hurt my back while lifting a bag or traveling. I said, this is a physical manifestation of a burnout. And all I can say is that as much as I've pushed you and as much as I've pushed myself, you need to take a step back and think about, you know, your own work-life balance and your own uh, work ethic and your own ethic towards your family and your own time. So that was a that was a really difficult time for me because I'd never ever imagined that I would I'd seen people go through it and you know I I I've, I've been cynical about it and I've been like really you burnt out is that a thing 
and I can confirm now humbly that I was wrong, that that was, that is a thing and uh, I've been through it. Interesting. Good to know. Yeah, I ended up at an ashram in India and, in, you know, in, uh, in, in the eastern coast of India doing a month of meditation and yoga to, to recover. How is that experience like? What did you do? Oh, it was just basically something that, you know, you end up, it, it wasn't, it was a beautiful place, you know, right on the Bay of Bengal, overlooking the sea. And, you know, you basically went from 5.30 in the morning till 8.30 at night, uh, you know, on various, uh, a lot of mental peace, a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation, uh, a lot of massage therapies, which are designed to help you relax. Uh, and, and it's all bespoke and it's, it's a naturopathy center. So a lot of uh, doctors or so doctors is assigned to you and they sort of take you through a bespoke program for the time that you're there. Um, and uh, actually a doctor in Switzerland recommended, he said, why don't you think about doing this? And I said, oh, where should I do it? Where should I do it in Switzerland? Should I do it in Austria? Should... And he said, you know what? Go home, go home to India. This is the home of this stuff. And you yeah. will you will feel comfortable, you will feel rooted, and there'll be nothing lost in translation, go home. And I tell you, it was the best piece of advice my doc could have given me right here in Switzerland. And uh, I went back after that and I thanked him and I said, you were so right. So, so that was like 30 days and that was it, 30 days in in that place but it was it was 100 days away from work wow and so okay so you go away from work and then you do the 30 days in india what are those is it like vipassana where you don't eat only once a day or something like that and you don't talk to people How, what's it like no it wasn't that extreme it was it it, it was basically you know it was this series of meditation, yoga, and therapies. Uh, the food is controlled as in it's, it's very stylish, but it's very controlled. So you eat very limited amounts, but you never feel hungry because of the way that they do it. And, you know, a glass of juice here and food there. And so you, so you, the, the, the basic mind body thing that they work on is that if to, in order to clean your mind, they also need to clean your system. Right. And that's the philosophy behind naturopathy. And I found that to be fascinating. So, you know, there's a, there's a few books written on it. There's one called Gut by a German doctor, Julia Enders, if you've ever read that. Yeah. Um, and uh, she explains, you know, the importance of the gut. And that's what they do. They basically end up uh, cleaning your gut. I mean, I think in 25 days, I ate 12,000 calories in all, uh, which was fascinating. And I never yeah. felt hungry. So, you know, I came away feeling mentally and physically light. Yeah, we have a, uh, one of my charities, Why Not Three, that founded Startup Funding Event, um, got certified three years ago by a German lab um, called Alcat uh, Laboratories. They uh, do blood test analysis on uh, how your immune system reacts to certain food sensitivities. Right. Uh, so very interesting stuff i'm very much into it but obviously we can talk about that for hours and not the yes. point of this but i really liked uh, what you said um about those 30 days uh, it seems super interesting as well in which city did you do it in this is a little city in uh, it's, a, it's a very long name it's called vishakhapatnam uh, which is on the eastern coast of india overlooking the bay of bengal and how do you find it? Is it like a website and you just sign up or? No, it was referred to me by a friend of mine in, in India who had been, who goes there regularly, but for short durations, just to detox kind of thing. Um, and he said, maybe you should call them and have a conversation. And so I did. And I felt like this was the right thing to do. And I did it. And if other like listeners want to find it, which not specifically this one, but others like it, what do you type into Google usually? I mean, I would, if you just wanted to be in India specifically, I would just say, you know, naturopathy clinics uh, in India or Ayurveda clinics in India. Um, this particular one I went to was called Pima, which is P-E-M-A. And if you just Google Pima, it'll show up. 
um, yeah, but uh, it was it was pretty much uh, not not to sort of overstress it, but I think it was pretty life altering for me. Great. So um, a bit digressed, but um, last question around that topic. So when you came back from that, how is it going now? What's happening um, mentally as well? And which are back? Well, I think that, you know, just going back to your point about the work-life balance for the first time in my 30 years of work, I actually came back with the resolve of putting in the work-life balance. And that's what I started doing from the day I went back to work after that, uh, which is that, you know, I would work a certain number of hours in the day. At a certain point in the evening, I will switch off uh, because I will treat that time as my time and family time and not have that work swirling around the whole way. And then the next morning I will work, but when I work, I will give it my all. And, and you know, I will follow my yoga and walking and whatever other routines, but construct a much more balanced day rather than a work that is basically work with bits of, you know, food and other things thrown in. And, and I think that that is a, uh, you know, can't stress it enough. I think it's important for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Our philosophy uh, around the work-life balance is divided into health, wealth, and relationships. So every day, um, one of the three needs to be, like all three need to be ticked. So you need to focus a little bit on health, exercise, mental health, uh, wealth, obviously, that's the one that everybody focuses on, and uh, relationships as well. But sorry, we digressed a lot. So we going back to MTV, you just got appointed managing director. Um, the question I wanted to ask was, um, from what I heard from you, pretty much the team is the thing. So you recruited an, a team to um, be at it. And that's pretty much what got you to, to get through the day and start um, being successful there or what? Yeah, so the team, I mean, ultimately, it really comes down to the strength of the team and what is the overall vision that you can craft with them, you know, engage them in the vision um, and lead, lead from the front. You know, if you need to cut a licensing deal, go out there and cut it and show it so that other people are inspired to do the same. I think that that's something that I've always believed in and many, many, many people do believe in that, that you know, they'll, they'll show you how it's done rather than tell you how it's done. And I think that that's a good way to, to empower teams, to inspire them. And yeah, so the team, I had a team of about 100 people by the end of it at MTV India when I finally handed over to someone else. You added 100 people to the team? Yes. Wow, crazy. So what were your first hires? What was lacking and what did you think needed to be added? and how did you recruit those people? Well, the first people were basically in programming. That was essentially because if you didn't have a product, you didn't have anything to market, you didn't have any airtime to sell anything. So the first effort was really around recruiting around the programming area uh, and, and uh, you know, some marketing uh, around that. But then, you know, as soon as I could, I had the mandate to hire the head of the office. Uh, that, was, that was a process that obviously involved many people and then that that helped, you know, he then drove a lot of the stuff once he was in, in the saddle. And uh, I could um, I could then sort of take a slight uh, slightly back seat uh, while he fixed the programming and I could focus on a few other things uh, that was. Uh, so this happened for about three years before I took over Southeast Asia and handed over MTV India to another person. You took over MTV Southeast Asia or? Yes, MTV Southeast Asia. So I was running the five countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, and uh, Singapore, yeah. What was the difference between, you know, managing one region and then suddenly managing multiple? Well, a, a huge difference. Well, the um, in MTV India, well, one was it's one country, right? And you have a prevalent you know, dominant form of music in the form of Bollywood. In, in the five countries that you're talking about, there isn't anything that is common in that sense. So you've got five relatively small countries, right? With 
their own music scene happening with some amount of international music crossing borders. Yeah. But it also meant that, you know, you were dealing with five different sets of agencies to sell time, five completely different sets of audiences that you were marketing to, different languages that you were working in. Uh, so much more complex in that sense, even though it was much smaller from an overall size point of view. But great learning, because again, you were dealing with the music industry in five different countries, uh, which operate in a completely different way from, you know, what they would have, would have operated in us in uh, India or in Hong Kong or Singapore. So maybe, great, great learning. Maybe interesting for me, because I'm always scared entering markets that I don't know the language of. But here you're telling me you are managing countries. Did you know all the languages? No, I didn't. Uh, I actually knew none of them. Uh, but this is where the teams really come into play. And uh, your teams are, you know, are obviously from the countries. They speak the language. Um, but when you're fortunately, when you're speaking at, at more senior levels, you know, people are generally quite bilingual when it comes to their language and English. So I'm able to actually operate. Uh, it always helps if you can speak the language. But yeah, I didn't. I did try to learn Bahasa, which you could then speak in Indonesia and Malaysia, but I never got to a point where I could operate in it. So pretty much the team, but you just said lead by example, which is kind of also my philosophy. So how do you do that? Because you're pretty much you can do a lot once. I mean, I guess, you know, English and they are bilingual. But my obviously the stories that I hear, which is why I'm a bit more scared going into the Asian markets is i mean especially china you need to know you know chinese you can't just go with your english and do stuff no no i think in countries like china korea um it's very difficult if you're not taiwan it's very difficult if you're not a language speaker so there are some countries where you could operate so like a malaysia like a philippines um you can operate but it's i think the so the, the ones that I'm referring to within the Southeast Asian were a little bit more amenable to, to working in a bilingual fashion. Though Indonesia, you need to definitely be an Indonesian speaker. And I had a very good right-hand man there who basically knew the industry completely. So he was able to, you know, essentially, once we had done a couple of things by example, he was able to take the reins over and run it so that I could keep my, you know, keep my time for high level stuff or, you know, uh, just extending reach within within the circles here. So when you're going into multiple regions, then technically you should be the overarching um, managing director. And then you would have in every region their own managing directors that would be doing literally all the operational stuff. That is exactly right. I don't think that there's any other way to do it, because if you try to be operational in a country that you're not resident in you're going to suffer and uh, and i think that you also lose the credibility of the market because the market then sees you as a you know somebody parachuting in and, yeah. and not being there and therefore you're not part of the fabric and i think for mtv what's important is that if mtv was not a, not in the fabric of society you were irrelevant so we had to do stuff we had to make sure that the partnerships were all taking place on a real time basis, you know, on a topical basis so that we showed up in the right events, that the right people came to us. And that's not possible till you have a strong team in the on the ground. Uh, what are some of the like most fun stories or most learning stories from the MTV time? Well, I, <laughs> uh, I think the the one thing that sort of sticks in my mind is uh, you know, we used to have this concept like radios have DJs. You've got, you had the VJ, right? The video jockey on MTV. And uh, we had this, uh, uh, this, this massive uh, VJ hunt uh, that we were conducting in, in the, the Philippines and in Indonesia. And that itself was a big marketing event uh, called the VJ hunt. And where, you know, people come to, you know, it's like a talent show, if you will, <laughs> uh, except that you're, you know, you have the power of your channel to advertise it. 
uh, you can make it funny, you can make it a lot of fun, and you can have a lot of on-ground events to actually bring the two things together. And we yeah. ran this huge exercise across uh, Indonesia and the Philippines, and it gave us a lot of visibility because we also needed the visibility for ourselves, for people to know that MTV was active, that we were looking to recruit VJs from their countries for the channel. You know, that becomes another point of con connect, right? Because you've got somebody from the country talking to you, not some foreigner who doesn't speak the language, etc., etc. And uh, that was, you know, a huge exercise and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and I remember spending a fair bit of time in the Philippines and Indonesia with my teams, getting that together. And it was across all the newspapers and the TV channels and it, it made quite a lot of noise. Uh, and we ended up recruiting these people, these VJs, who were who became absolute rock stars in their in their own right. So it was a successful exercise. Don't you think it's funny, um, especially as I'm getting into entrepreneurship, um, I'm starting to notice more and more that there are the rock stars that we all know about, but then behind them are actually like the entrepreneurs or the managing directors hiring. Uh, making those decisions based on data like you said marketing and they pretty much have complete anonymity <laughs> yet they control the whole story don't you think that's a bit weird or what is your perception of that i i think that that I don't, i'm not entirely sure as to how to react to that because you're right in what you say but i it's also it's also um, right in, in terms of its ultimate uh, result because you are looking to hire someone who's going to, who needs to be a rock star to yeah. be the face or the ambassador for that particular product or channel or whatever in that country. Now, how that person got to be is probably not of much interest to the public at large. It may be of interest to people like you or you know, other people who are actually talking through the, the, the backstory. But, um, and, and you know, one hopes that, uh, you know, that it was a successful enterprise in the end because for an entrepreneur, I think that delivering on, you know, delivering on a, on a vision or delivering on a, or, you know, having that output, not even the output, the outcome, and actually impacting a marketplace of that size is a uh, is is really the the holy grail, so to speak. Yeah, I'm noticing also just looking at my personality and some of my friends who are successful that usually uh, we're mostly introverts and don't want uh, the light to be on us um, unless it is absolutely necessary. Like you do press uh, sometimes or. You have to be like on a podcast or something, right? But uh, but preferably you want um, your team to to take that spotlight so that you can actually focus on operational stuff and growing the vision instead of dealing with press and stuff like that. Right. Um, sorry. So okay. So now we are. I think after MTV, that's when you started going into actually entrepreneurship and stuff, right? That is correct. So how, what was happening within MTV that you were saying, I mean, because at this point you're managing, you have a pretty good job and most people would be pretty happy with it. So why take the risk? What was going through your mind? How did you eventually decide to take that risk? And, and you know, why this startup? So, so two things, basically, if you remember when I started out at Star TV and then continued with MTV, I was basically in a non-legacy industry. We were setting new rules on how marketing happened, how sales happened, etc. Yeah. This is now five, seven years later. It was no longer a startup industry. It was getting to almost being a legacy industry already, right? This is how television channels are run. This is how sales is done. This is so we were getting to that point and I was like, oh boy, okay, that happened much quicker than I expected. How come it happened so quick? Because that's like five years, that's nothing. Yeah, like seven, yeah, seven years for the satellite television industry because it took over so quickly that it needed to get, you know, corporatized very, very fast because the amount of money that was involved was quite large. 
and and therefore it needed to have the systems come in and the governance etc cetera, etc cetera. so it got corporatized very quickly um, but the other thing that was happening at this time was the internet so suddenly this thing called the internet was beginning to bubble and because um, which year is this this is now nine this is 99 okay all right 98 99 and i i remember you know i had a from my first early days in 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 j walter thompson my my client at unilever was a rock star of marketing okay he used to be the head of personal products for unilever he then went to north america he was the head of personal products there blah 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 anyway i kept in touch with him and he was my my guru so to speak and uh, I, I remember in 99, I was, I was in New York uh, for, a, for an MTV, da, da, da. And I went uh, across to see him and I said, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, thinking about the next step, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. And he said, he was a very, he was a very cerebral guy and he was like, you know, very uh, knowledgeable uh, and analytical. And he said, you know, if I were you and if I was your age, because he was like a good 25 years older than me, right? Or something like that. He said, if I was your age, I would find out what this internet thing is all about. <laughs> and that's where I would put my focus. And I still remember, you know, I went in for a certain endorsement and I came out with a certain confusion, right? And I remember sitting on the train ride all the way back from Connecticut to New York City. And I was like, what did he just tell me? What, what did he say? Because he doesn't waste his words, right? I know that he's not going to make stupid remarks off the cuff. I said, what did he say exactly? And it, it stayed with me. And I went through the whole travel and you know, meetings for the next week. And, and it just never left me. And I just it was buzzing in my head all the way back to Singapore. And then I was sitting and I came back to Singapore and I went to this, you know, you had a lot of these internet society meetings in those days. And this is web 1.0, right? In 1998, yeah. 1999. It's like, is it like blockchain meetings when blockchain was coming up? That's exactly right. Those kind of meetings, but this was around internet, right? And more basic than that. And I said, okay. I, and I ended up at one of these where it happened to be around music. And, and I was, I had no idea what to expect. And I was listening to, you know, this group that was sitting there on the little panel. It was one of those very internet-y cafe kind of things, you know, <laughs> could hardly hear anyone. And nobody knew what the other person was talking about. Everybody pretended they knew a lot more than what they actually knew and, you know, all that. Anyway, so I knew nothing. I knew nothing about the internet except what my guru had told me. And he said, you know, find out about this thing. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Anyway, so I'm listening to them and I'm like, they don't know what they're talking about. What, what did, there isn't a lot of real stuff coming out here. So I started reading and I started trying to learn what's going on. And obviously, because I was in the music related industry, I started looking at it from a music standpoint. At the same time, you know, the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany had just created the MP3 format, right? And uh, and everybody was saying, okay, this is the means to move stuff around on the internet. And I'm like, oh my God, what is this thing, right? And, and people were like, everybody was losing, the internet was losing its shit, right? And Napster was then going to happen in a few months time, which we didn't know at that time. So at that point in time, there were two or three of us from MTV who said, you know, what if, what if we actually did this did the next stage of what MTV should be doing, which is on the internet. So I yeah. said, well, the logical thing to do is to have the conversation with MTV and say, why don't we, you know, look at this. That conversation was just a bad idea because it went nowhere. And, you know, people were locked into the legacy of being a television business, not being a music related business. Really? Yep. Oh, God. no, no surprise. But there. don't they have like, uh, so maybe that's something modern. But I can imagine when you have so much money like MTV, you have an R&D department, innovation, something to test out new things. You know, the, my, my fundamental philosophy is that 
unless you're an Apple or a Google, seriously, innovation does not come from big corporations. Innovation comes from small, unfettered units that are then absorbed by corporations. But what's the, what's the difference between an Apple and a Google, uh, Google and the rest? They've, I think they've grown in this era where they've been able to keep that sense of innovation and keep it from being annihilated by the, the legacy business. So in Google, you'll still have people who are hidden away working on moonshots and working on various things. And then they'll get introduced new products into the system on a regular basis, likewise with Apple. And I think that that is an art for them not to allow real innovation to be stifled by the legacy products. Do you think, do you think it's a Silicon Valley thing? Because when I look at companies like a Tesla or something, they seem to have that as well. Yeah, see, Tesla is still, you know, start, not a startup anymore, but it's unique in its, in its uh, sort of, uh, again, the electric vehicle, right? If you think about it, look at the number of car manufacturers around the world, right? Yeah. Anybody could have done a Tesla, but they didn't because the people who handle the benzene engines would not in any way see that, want to see their business line threatened by somebody creating an electric vehicle to that extent within their organization. It has to have come from outside. So I think that it's the same philosophy. It, it happens very rarely in big corporations. It doesn't not happen. I think Samsung is another example where it probably happens. Uh, but I don't think that it happens in a lot of big corporations. And that's why they get disrupted. I I once read a book about innovation uh, that really kind of clicked it for me why that happens, which was um, the reason it doesn't come from inside the corporate is because so many people have jobs, there's overhead and something works. And if you know it works, you want to keep making money. Right. You definitely don't want to start inventing something that will cannibalize your own business because you don't know what's going to happen. Whereas a startup like a Tesla, for instance, they don't have money so they start stuff yeah they start stuff and any you know new tesla they sell that's more money for tesla that's not uh, a cannibalization of their business um and i think there's only one company that i know of that has actually done that and that was disney um i read the book from bob Iger, and apparently he pretty much risked a lot to launch Disney Plus, which was pretty much a cannibalization of how they do uh, some of their licensing deals, if I was correct. Uh, and now it's resulting, obviously, in the results that they're getting. Um, but when I was reading his book, I started understanding how scary it can be. In a startup, it's normal to be scared because you don't know where the sales are coming from. But if you're a Disney and you have salaries and suddenly you don't even know if your Disney Plus is going to be paying off. Yeah, I can imagine that being scary. Um, but yeah, innovation is uh, interesting how that goes. But even I think I, I take your story of Disney and Disney Plus, but I would also say that it took a Netflix for Disney Plus to take shape. That's true. And That's I think true. that the, I think Netflix is a fantastic example where they killed their old old business to do their new business. How, what was the business of Netflix before? Ah, see, you're too young to know that. So Netflix used to send out uh, DVDs in the mail. I didn't know that. <laughs> so their entire business was built on DVD mailers. So they, you would subscribe and they would send you these three movies a month or week or whatever it was. And they wouldn't want it back, then you just kept it or destroyed it. And that business was the core of Netflix when they recognized streaming. So they killed the delivery business to move into streaming. That's the beauty really? of Reed Hastings. Yeah, it's a story. I had no idea. That's crazy. So this was all in my time, right? So I've seen a few more years. <laughs> but uh, cool. Uh, so. <laughs> We're going back to the, the small meetings. Uh, yeah, so these small internet. meetings and, yeah. and beginning to learn that, okay, this is something I need to read and I need to learn. And we started having these conversations with these two or three people. And we said, what if? And, and, and we then said, look, there's no takers. Let's have the convo. Let's actually write out what a business plan would look like. 
This but what was the idea? The idea was simple. How do you do a, a, a music business on the internet? How do you sell music on the internet? Really? Yeah, simple. It was uh, as 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 uh, naive as a startup idea can get, right? Because it was that music, the internet is going to grow at this. All these, you know, all these. Um, what do you call it, projections were coming out about how the internet was going to take off, and they were all right, by the way. And then uh, we were talking about the MP3 format and other formats that are going to come to light, and these are going to transport music and other things on the internet. At that time, we were talking about, and this amazing thing called 3G is going to happen in a few years. And, you know, 3G means, my God, who knows what it could do. And, uh, you know, so people was, and then mobile phones are really getting ramped up. At that time, mobile phones couldn't do a lot. Um, and we were still talking about WAP. I think you're too young to know. Yeah, no, I remember, I remember WAP. You remember WAP? So okay. I, so pretty much you're setting up an, almost like an iTunes store or exactly like an iTunes. That store. was exactly right. That was exactly right. So we, and this, we and predated, two, we predated iTunes, or? we predated iTunes by three years. So you're this launched in the year two thousand, right? Yes, that's right. Wow. Okay, so continue uh, the story. So you're brainstorming. You're writing the. So we're brainstorming. Model. We then went to the. We we had a contact, and somebody said you should talk to this agency, which is part of the Singapore government, and it's a technology board uh, agency. Uh, and uh, we said okay. And so we said, went to them, and all that we had was our thinking and a piece of paper, nothing more, nothing less. And we said, this is what we are looking to do. I mean, what is it that you want? You know, what wait. Is it? So it's you and who else? How many? It's people? three of us from uh, three of us, two of us from MTV, another person who was from outside, uh, and we are uh, just taking this idea forward to this uh, to this. Uh, technology board, science and technology board, and Singapore loves its technology. Uh, and uh, we said, here's what we're looking to do. I don't know whether you have any advice or anything for us. And they said, hmm. and they looked at our pedigree, our, you know, our connectivity, our backgrounds, etc. And they said, okay, why don't we pull together a group for us to have a group meeting yeah. uh, in the next two weeks or whatever it was. And we said, Okay, what, what's this group? They said, well, there'll be other interested parties and then we can take a call as to, you know, what... what. So when we went to this meeting, uh, two weeks later, it was, it was like being hit by a thunderbolt. I remember walking into this room and there were about 12 or 13 people in that room. And these were the doyens of Singapore industry and of Singapore Inc. And these are names that you read off once in a while because they're that much in the stratosphere and i said oh my god what are they doing in this room and of course the singapore government the economic development board has the ability to bring together the right players and they said well here's the best that we could muster now do your thing tell them about your business and we were like and we were just so awestruck with the with the talent in the room but anyway you know, we were we had a strong sense of conviction of our business. We launched into it, and those ten people sitting around the table became our first ten investors. But wait, so how old are you at this point? At this point in time, I am thirty-five. And are you still heading MTV, or no? I've left. I've you left. Quit? To, I'm just about to quit to do this. But you're about to quit, but you're still in the position, right? Um, let me think. So when this meeting happened, I had not, I, I had, I was going to tender my resignation a week later. Wow. When wow. this meeting happened. So that made it even more real for me. Right. So, so then you have those 10 people, pretty much the highest investors in Singapore at the time or... Uh, big investors, both for Singapore and for the region. Very can, well known. Can I ask what the initial fund, uh, how much you raised initially was? The grand total of $1 million. For how much? Uh, you mean what percentage? Yeah, what percentage? If I remember correctly, it would have been around 
Oh, that's a really good valuation. Yeah. So it was a it was a real moment, and uh, to get that quality of endorsement was yeah. just stunning. And they said, yes, we are in. And people just went around the room and said they're in. And and we were like, oh, my God, we had not really planned for this. Uh, yeah. So let's start running. And uh, after that, because we were now connected to this group and we were connected to that level of people, the doors that started opening for us were fantastic. And we were being invited to exactly the right meetings. We were being invited to speak, to share our thoughts, we were clearly the thought leader in this particular space. Uh, so then between Hong Kong and Singapore, which were the two centers of the music industry, we were really the, the, the thought leader very quickly. So how many months are we talking about from you not knowing anything, going to your first shady internet meeting to that meeting? So from me going to that first shady internet meeting to going to that meeting is is about five months. Wow. That's four fast. months, four to five months. So it really What's happened it? at internet speed. What was the business model that convinced them? Did you say you were going to put MP3s in a store and how? Well, we said two things. One is that there's that music licensing will move online eventually. We, of course, predicted it to be very aggressively quick, but it wasn't that quick. And then the second was that we would also be able to use this platform, just like in those days mp3.com did, to find new artists. So people would be able to put up their stuff because you, know, you now had a format and that's not yeah. licensed music and we would do both things. So they loved both the ideas. Uh, and, uh, and because they, I mean, we had projections in terms of how the music industry would eventually have to move online. And by the way, all of that is true. Today in 2020, I can sit here hand on heart and say what we said to people in the year 2000 was absolutely right. Wow. So you predicted everything. So then, okay, you get the million. Um, you have three other co-founders. So you're with four in total. Yeah. You obviously at this point have not been an entrepreneur yet. I mean, you've managed everything, but suddenly you have a million. What do you do? <laughs> So we now start building our team. So we start building our team and we, um, uh, we, we uh, you know, technology, none of us were technologists. So we needed to bring in the technology chops. We needed to bring in, uh, you know, the relevant licensing people to help us because licensing is complicated in the music industry. Uh, yeah. So I had a fundamental of it, but I had to bring in, we had to bring in lawyers because the whole music industry is run by the legal profession, if you ask me. Um, and so be it. And uh, as we started ramping up from there and we started talking to music companies around the region, uh, we basically had our, uh, our big moment was when creative technologies, you know, these are the guys who make the, the, the actually they're the reason why we have sound on the PC. So this is one of those well-kept secrets that they invented the first sound card for the PC. Really? Right? And they invented, therefore, you have music on the PC because of creative technologies. Uh, and Creative Labs, which is based out of Silicon Valley and Singapore, it's a Singapore headquartered company, they came in as a strategic Series A investor, uh, literally months after that first round. So suddenly we were you know, validated by a listed company who brought in big, big funding. And, uh, you know, and suddenly we had the ability to tie in with a hardware manufacturer. And it was really a very, very important moment in our, in our history. Can I ask how many months after it was and how much funding it was that Creative Labs and provided? I think I'm, I don't think I'm able to say how much the creative funding was for whatever no. historical okay. reason. But how many months? After? But it was, uh, I would think that it was something like six to seven months after the first round. And how much percentage did they ask for? I think or that we, we ended up... Uh, I think maybe somewhere in that 20% area. Oh, so they got much more than those initial Yeah, yeah, ones. because they came in with a huge amount of funding. 
and uh, and but then by then you know the valuation was always see, obviously seen as as having grown uh, but we the founders still retained majority shareholding at that point wow. in time so it was really quite interesting for us to have been able to do that so yeah what are you guys exited that company eventually yes we eventually we exited 10 years later in 2009 we were acquired by motorola uh, and uh, because motorola was looking to do the integration with hardware pretty much like the apple like creative uh, but eventually motorola itself went under because you know they sold the company to google and then to thinkpad and lenovo and yeah. everybody else yeah i heard so yeah that Actually, was the exit I met uh, one of the Motorola heads. Uh, they're a much smaller team now uh, in the Netherlands, based here. And uh, yeah, it's uh, you think it's a much bigger team, but it's, it's very small. But um, so, what were like the biggest ups and downs going through that journey? Because obviously, a lot of self validation in the beginning. Um, but you know, the market is the market; they're gonna hit you. So I can imagine at one point things didn't go as nicely. So I think two a couple of things that just stand out just to sort of move that along. I think the first thing was that music licensing took very long because the 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 labels as legacy businesses were very scared to license digitally and because it would hurt their physical business. Same same old same old same problem that you've yeah. seen in other industries. So that took some time and we had to do quite a lot of strong advocacy communications uh, for that, you know, write opinion editorials about the benefits of MP3 music, the benefits of digital music, the reason why com companies should not be scared, you know, so a lot of stuff to push people uh, in that direction. The second was on that journey between the initial validation to the final step, there was a huge step in the middle that took place as a part of un unforeseen uh, evolution of the market was the ringtone market and the ringtone market saved everybody's skin who was in this business because the music licensing was taking very long and what a lot of people don't know is that the ringtone licenses are not held by the record companies oh. the ringtone licenses are held by the publishers so the publishers are the people who own the copyright to a piece of music so you can reproduce a ringtone which is in the tune but not the actual sound recording. Record companies own the actual sound recording, not the underlying copyright. So suddenly, while that was taking time, the publisher stepped in and created this multi-million dollar ringtone industry, which we also partook with and you know had the monotone ringtones and the polyphonic ringtones and the da-da-da, if you remember. I it remember got that. really ringtone. Everybody had a, 10 different ringtones on their phones and etc. etc. So that was quite an interesting moment. And then we moved into the ability to do downloadable music, downloadable video, and then it moved into streaming. So we exited just before the streaming thing started happening. So that's a good kind of moment to exit. It was a good moment to exit because at that point, if you went into streaming, you needed to be raising in the 20, 30, 50 million dollar range to be able to you know, bring the technology to bear. And at that point in time, we had been 10 years in the business. We were not sure whether we had the, the energy to actually yeah. do another 10 years on that. Because that business sounds very much like a constant fight and not like you get, you get to a certain level and then pretty much people come to you. It seems like you were constantly fighting. Yeah, there's no cruise control at all. Wow. So how did you... What was your position uh, within the startup? Well, uh, sorry, I didn't understand. Sorry, well, your position. What were you mostly in charge for? Oh, I was the CEO for the for the startup, and uh, so. I but was... as a CEO, obviously, um, with co-founders, were you like operational? Were you managing the teams? Did you have a focus? So one of the co-founders was my COO. And the other co-founder had by that time for family reasons opted out of the operations. So then we had a full team of about 85 people spread out across three offices. 
and uh, it was professionally run, if you will. So we, we were quite proud of that. So was the transition hard going from, uh, you know, managing director Nike, uh, sorry, Nike, MTV. I'm in the wrong podcast, um, MTV, and then um, obviously like smaller team, but still 85 people, kind of same region. So it's not like you moved house. So was it like much different or? Well, it was just it was just that we were breaking new ground. So we were, you know, working in an area that people didn't understand, that people didn't understand the intricacies of. So it was a very proud moment. The whole 10 years was a very proud moment for us because we were we were people. We were the go to organization if people needed to understand what was happening with digital media. They would come to us and ask us for comment. They would ask us to write something. They would ask us to interview. And, and so it was, a, you know, it was the pressure was on us to keep ahead of the curve and to make sure that we were not letting the business fall over. So it was a good. Time. Was it close to falling over sometimes? No, it was. It was. Well, it wasn't close to falling over, but it was we had some we had some moments where we had to take decisions like, OK, so the music licensing is taking long do we actually move into the ringtone area? That was a strategic call that we had to take. And it then held us in good stead for a good three years while yeah. music licensing happened. The second was that we used to work a lot with you know the Yahoo's and the MSN.com's, etc. And we had to take a decision that do we continue with them or do we move into the telecom companies, you know, the Optus, okay. Telstra, Vodafone, etc. And that was a shift for the organization to say, okay, we're not targeting these as customers, we're targeting the telcos as carriers. And that was are a those, big shift. Are those decisions hard to make? How many people were involved? What, what, what was so hard about it? So these were difficult decisions. We, had, we were at an offsite, about 20 of us at an offsite, and we said, you know, these are the big decisions facing us. What do you think we should be doing? And people, you know, we broke out in groups, we had a lot of brainstorm and we came out and said, okay, we need to complete these licenses. We need to move into telcos, we need, and we concluded that and it was fantastic because we came away from there saying, okay, everybody's vested in this. We need to get this done. Whether you're in Australia, whether you're in India, whether we're in Singapore. And I was, it was up to me to deliver the first of those things. And I said, okay, I will deliver the first one. And we will then use that as a as a model to tweak the others. And, and I remember working on one in India and one in Australia at the same time. And we delivered both. And it was a it was a turning point for the organization. Are those decisions taken unanimously, or is there always somebody saying, mm, "I'm not so sure about that"? I think we came away unanimous. I can't remember the whole. Um, I think everybody agreed that, you know, we needed to get this done on this route. And I think there may have been some umming and oing and some detractors, uh, but I think that they, the reasoning, it wasn't that somebody was saying, this is what we have to do and then get others to buy in. It was the team that came up and said, look, I think we need to be able to get into telco land, otherwise we're in trouble. Yeah. So, okay, maybe some interest from my side, but how did you organize those offsites? Like, how is, is it like a weekend retreat? Like what's happening? And yeah, how, so, how is the day organized? Like, is there a facilitator? So this is, a, this is, you know, this is like an annual getaway that we used to do. It's just that we were at a moment. So we said, okay, this is the time to do it. Let's not wait for what, whatever would have been the annual time. But this is a moment, let's get together and uh, do this meeting now because we've got a few big decisions to make. And we know what are the decisions that we need to work around. What do we do? And we want these people around the table. We, uh, we had no funding to the level that we had external facilitators. It was us. We sit down together and we work it through. And uh, so it's, it's very informal. Uh, and uh, it's basically the lead managers from each of the offices. So India, Singapore, Indonesia, and Australia, uh, and, and a few key people from the, from the Singapore headquarters. So about 20 people tops, maybe 15. If and I it's, a, it's like a weekend or a week? Or yeah, it was a weekend. And I remember we went away to a little island of Malaysia 
uh, which is cheap enough to get to <laughs> uh, in in those days. And uh, and it was a very very uh, powerful set of meetings and a powerful set of decisions. So that meeting stays with me because it actually helped us craft the the next few years in terms of how we built. And and that was the reason why we became attractive to people like Motorola, who eventually yeah. acquired us. Oh, so that one meeting eventually led to that big decision. So, uh, go, sorry, going still back to the meeting. So you leave like on a Friday, I'm assuming, and then the meeting starts on Saturday from nine no, to five. No, I, I used to drive us pretty hard. So we would leave on a Friday and we would get there on the Friday afternoon and we would start the meeting on the Friday afternoon. <laughs> And uh, but we would we would uh, we would work hard and we would go all the way till dinner till eight o'clock and then we would party and then we would uh, work hard the next day. Everybody would be at the tables at nine o'clock in the morning and we would bust our chops through till the evening and then we would party at night at eight o'clock at night again. But we would have good, you know, 12 hour days uh, really working through. And so, and then on the content wise, how did you, like, did you have a whiteboard and you just wrote things down? Yes, yeah, so you just write stuff, charts, whiteboards, and then, you know, this one chart at the end of it saying, these are the three things we need to do. And there were some names against it. And we said, all right, we know what we need to do. Let's just go out and do it. Cool. Is and there anybody who feels that they can't do it? And, and people were like, don't talk rubbish. And then, you know, we all do vodka shots and move. <laughs> any tips for startups who are at a pivot especially now with corona happening like i can imagine pivotal decisions need to be made any tips for them going through something like this how to like get the team on board how to do something like this yeah look this is a really really tricky situation in many ways right because yeah it's not just what the team decides it's what your environment is dealing with because you may lose partners because they can't operate or whatever. So it's, it's sort of a difficult one for me to, uh, to say, but I would say that in startup land, which is mostly digital, I think that they are at a distinct advantage because they are not dependent on the physical infrastructure and the digital infrastructure has survived really well through the COVID crisis, right? Correct. So for the digital infrastructure to survive, it means that the core of their business is already on a strong foundation. So it's really now a conviction of their belief in their business model that they need to actually, you know, barrel down along and stay focused, you know, take a big decision, stay on it, because otherwise, if you start dithering, then you're probably, of course, I'm not saying you don't move if the other things don't move, but if the externalities don't change, and you've taken a call, you know, stick the course, stay the course if your team has decided that this is what you want to do. Yeah, good tips. Um, man, there's so much to unpack, but obviously uh, no time. So I want to go through the important parts. Uh, so the acquisition of Motorola, where did Motorola come from? How did you guys find them? How did that negotiation go? Um, can you th talk about that? Yeah. So we had uh, Motorola approached us uh, through, well, we had, an, we had a firm representing us. Um, uh, the, the board had decided that, you know, we will appoint this, this firm to represent us. What do you uh, mean this firm representing us? The, like a, uh, the financial firm. So Lazar Brothers was representing us. And they sell businesses or? Yes, what so is, they do M&As, okay. right? And uh, Lazard then reached out in their network and came back with a query from Motorola as to that they would like to start a discussion. And then, you know, we spent some time with Motorola away in Libertyville in Chicago. Uh, and then they came, you know, and then we sort of, then this came to Hong Kong and Singapore and we sort of, sort of danced a bit and they said, okay, this is serious. Let's start working towards, you know, what the bigger picture could look like. and. There were obviously several gates that we had to go through, uh, but what are those gates? What do they look like? Well, they were looking at, you know, what are the licenses that are in place? What are the businesses that are in place? How does this business work? What are the economics of the business? So their fundamental due diligence and they were bringing in their technical people. They were bringing in their business people. They were bringing in their M&A people. So different expertise groups from Motorola were then starting to interact with us for a period that went for, I would it feels like almost one year. 
Yeah. How does that, how did maybe obviously also for me to know, but at that level, isn't it scary to open up your books for a Motorola? Can't they just like copy your business? Well, Especially. they can, but again, I'm, I'm less worried about big companies trying to do innovative things, like, like we said. Yeah, smart. So, yeah. Smart. So, I mean, of course, we're all protected with some amount of NDAs, but yeah, it's a, I think it's just a rule of business, right? That it's a reality of business that you're going to have to open up your books if you're looking for a, for a acquisition, acquisition event. Acquisition, yeah. Yeah. So that was not, uh, there was no choice there. So it took a year and then, so what, you had interaction with their CEO or with their acquisition team or? Yeah, so we were dealing with their head of M&A for mergers and acquisitions and we were dealing with their, one of their marketing areas uh, who was their chief there. So these were our sort of two key engagement points in Chicago and they were dealing with us and I was the engagement point at my end. And uh, that took a, a significant amount of work to get to where we did, when we finally did the deal, uh, where we finally did the acquisition and signed that agreement. Uh, and then from there, it took us another few months before we closed the agreement, right? Because then we had to deliver on all the stuff that they needed. Um, and then we officially became a Motorola company for a period, but uh, at that point in time, Motorola itself was going through its own turmoil. And, um, you know, they went through a CEO change in the middle of our acquisition. So we were not sure as to where that would end up. But the acquisition happened, but the new CEO then decided that he did not want to play in the content space. So he, he exited all content businesses. So, it, so you made your money from the acquisition and then it stopped? And then they stopped. So what they did was they took pieces of the company, especially the technology platforms, and then they, they absorbed it into Motorola from a code point of view. And they took a couple of other things which they absorbed, but then the business by itself stopped the way that we were running it. Wow. And then you, well, usually when there's acquisition, you have to stay on for a couple of yes. years. 18 months. Many... So I was there for 18 months for the earn out. So you were 18 months a Motorola employee. <laughs> yeah, so 18 months we stayed and then this all happened at the end of the 18 months. So it wow. was good timing because we had made up our minds, most of the team, that we were going to move on anyway. Can uh, is, it, is it known how much the acquisition was? or No, it's not public. So Motorola never made it public. Okay. So yeah, this is their call. But it was a good pension fund or? Hey, you know, these, these are always relative terms, right? Who knows? I, I would just say that we were happy that, you know, it was a high profile acquisition. Okay, you know, sure. a company yeah. recognized us and, you know, we all came away, you know, relatively happy. So usually after this point, there's two decisions to make. You either become an investor or you start a new business. So right. what? Or what did you do? Because there is something you did two more things before you did WWF, right? No, that was it. I went straight from that. In fact, I finished on the 31st of July with Motorola. Yeah. I went to the airport and flew to Switzerland and started on Monday with WWF. What? Yes. But why? Why not? take? Okay, first, why not take a break? And I know how I did you end up from... How did you end up with WWF even? Because that is so different to everything yes. you told me. So what happened was that uh, at the time that the Motorola acquisition was announced and, you know, and then we were in the during the 18 months. So towards the last six months of the 18 months, uh, a headhunter called me and asked whether I would be interested in a dialogue with WWF. And I said, of course I would, but I can't understand why you would be calling me here for a Swiss based entity. Yeah. And they said, no, look, they're very keen on hiring somebody who comes with a marketing background, but in the digital space, because they, they do have a mandate to move this into the next, you know, next century, so to speak. And oh, uh, would you be fine. interested? And I said, well, I, I will be interested in a, in a few months for sure. And they said, yeah, well, it will take that long anyway, even if it does come through. And then we were thinking about it from a family point of view. It made sense because 
our kids were 12 and 9 at that time and we felt that it would be great to give them an opportunity they had been born and brought up in singapore we would love to give them a, a different uh, exposure uh, you know my wife and i were up for another adventure we had spent 15 years in singapore after hong kong cuz be... cuz your wife is she indian or singaporean oh, yes she's indian okay she's indian uh, but like me she's a naturalized singaporean and uh, we thought that this could work out well and so when the wwf offer materialized finally we said you know we'll do it we should we'll take the take the really but so isn't it hard going from entrepreneurship to like wh- how why did you get interested in the wwf so again it was you know it's all part of that nonlinear thinking and i i, I think that, you know, I had done corporate, I had done entrepreneurship, I had never done NGO. And I was really keen to understand because I was very much of a, like a closet, uh, you know, environmentalist, if you will. And, you know, I was interested in green technologies, etc., etc. But I wasn't totally uh, sure. And I said, okay, if I want to learn more about it, I need to go to one of the big boys yeah. and yeah. understand how it happens, right? And the thing that really interested me and clicked with me was was Earth Hour. So Earth Hour, which is the lights out campaign that happens at the end of every March, that was an, that was just been started. And I was very keen from an entrepreneurial point of view to see how that shaped up. And that was part of my portfolio as well. So when I got the opportunity to do this, I said, OK, great, new geography, new business, new sector and a startup like Earthar within my portfolio, all, all perfect storm. So that's how I ended up uh, there. Yes, should I have taken a break between Soundbuzz and Motorola, uh, between Soundbuzz and uh, WWF? Yes, uh, <laughs> but I, I didn't. And uh, you know, that was a bit silly. I wouldn't do that again. Uh, I would probably take a month to, to wind down before I start ramping up. And that wouldn't have changed anything. Um, I mean, on the other side, I mean, of course, yeah, you have to rest in hindsight. But on the other side, there was also momentum already happening from the other business and then probably helped as well in WWF, but obviously not healthy. Um, So don't do this at home, kids. (laughs) Don't do this at home. I would not recommend it. In fact, I know people, I know other senior managers here who insist for senior hires that their hires have taken a month in in between jobs, even though they have to wait for them. But they say they will come to me in much better shape than if they came to me a month earlier. That's very smart. I I think it's very smart. I've learned from that. I'm still learning. I'm learning every day. But so, okay, so you're joining WWF, completely different environment. I can imagine they were not very technically adept as the startup environment you just came from. No. So you come on Monday, also different country. What do you see? What's happening? Yeah, I'm, well, I think for the first, it's a complicated and complex structure. It's a huge organization. It's federated, so it doesn't work like a corporate. It's no command and control. It's, you know, it's all distributed. Um, you know, for the first year, year and a half, you're trying to figure out how things actually work. Uh, and you're trying to figure out what's your mandate because you don't have line responsibility over a lot of it. It's all network, it's consensus building, it's agenda forming, it's, you know, um, steering it it's in like a particular It's like politics direction. almost. It's all, like almost. having your own small country. Yeah, almost. And uh, you, you just need to try and fit that into the overall organizational agenda, but move your counterparts with you in a direction that you all create together. And so, you know, in a way, there was some commonality with what I'd done at a sound buzz, where you bring in your team members and you come up with a strategy. And, you know, so there was some of that that was happening, except that much more complicated. Plus you're dealing in a complicated environmental space, plus you're dealing in complicated geographies. So not easy. It took, took a while. It took me a couple of years to sort of even hit my stride so to speak. And, you know, I wasn't sure how long it would take. And I was surprised it took that long to to actually get comfortable with, okay, I now know how this beast operates to a degree. Because what, what was it about the mission of WWF that really attracted you to it? Well, just that, you know, that there were these guys 
who were addressing the environmental issues at a holistic level. So it wasn't just going into say, okay, I'm just going to work on the forest and everything else can wait yeah. because yeah. this is what I do. Whereas WWF was looking at, you know, why are the forests decreasing? The forests are decreasing because there are pressures. What are the pressures? They're related to, you know, urbanization, markets transforming, finance sector, etc., and all of that and therefore and so how do you actually deal with the drivers rather than just the pro the symptoms That's very and so it was a holistic view which was actually quite powerful for me looking in and understanding how the whole thing was structured so that's that's really where but the thing that really struck me was this this effort around earth hour and that this one movement it it was an antithesis to everything i had studied in my life you know, it was an open source brand. So you don't control the brand. All the brands that I'd worked on, MTV, Star TV, whatever, Unilever, were all brands that you control traditionally. Here was Earthar, a brand that you did not control, but it had millions of people working on it. How did that work? I want to know more. So how did that work? Yeah, so it's, it's actually, the whole concept of an open source brand is fascinating in terms of, how you actually have it effectively owned by the people rather than you own it. Or even if you legally own it, you give the mandate to the people to do what they need with it. But they all rally around it for the same purpose that you built it. But you don't try to control it. You don't try to control them. You let them interpret the brand as they will for their own geography. And, and so the two questions there, how does it happen that you know billions of people then do it and the second of it what if they interpret it in the wrong way so good both good questions so the first is that billions of people do it for the simple reason that it strikes a chord because these are people who feel that something needs to happen with respect to the environment whether it be climate or whether it be the, the nature or whatever and the second is that because it's being messaged in their country in a way that they can understand. So they might be talking about it from renewable energy perspective in Germany, and they may be talking about it from a forest perspective in Colombia, and they may be talking about it from a coal perspective in Greece. But So in, market segmentation. Right. And, and yeah. so it's being interpreted, but not by me. So over here, I can now take a step back and say, you need to use this to harness the power of the people to drive your environmental agenda, which relates to climate. That's the broadest thing I can say. And then they run off to do what they need. Whereas in earlier jobs, I would need to have defined it. So, so over here, I don't. But why don't you need to define it here though? Because, because it's a movement. Because when you're trying to create a movement, you can't control it. The, the whole, the, the, the ethos of a movement is that you need more people to come in and it needs to snowball from those people. You cannot control that snowball and you must not try to. So pretty much, if I'm hearing it correctly, bringing it down to the one sentence that you said, it's pretty much because it strikes a chord and, the, and that chord is what is WWF, but then the way the court is interpreted, that's the people. No, I don't even think the court is WWF. The court is their desire to signal that they are concerned about the environment, which is why they switch yeah. off the light. So most of them don't even know or care that it comes from WWF, and I love that. They don't need to. They just need to know what the cause is, and they then recruit their communities and their friends to participate in it, those who are interested. So that means that sometimes you have like movements that aren't even under the WWF brand, but still do most of it. Most of it. So let me put it like this. Nine, uh, Earth Hour is celebrated in roughly 180 countries. Yeah. There are WWF offices in 90 countries. So there are 90 countries where there isn't a single WWF person where Earth Hour is celebrated. Oh, and okay, even okay. within the countries where WWF is, we may only do it. For example, in China, we only organized some things in five cities. 
but Earth Hut took place in 195 cities. Uh, how do you explain that then? That's just, the just... beauty of open source branding. How do you take a brand and allow people to make it theirs? And how it, do you how do you tra can you translate that to a non NGO to like a very business? good question. I was actually just writing a paper on it this afternoon before we spoke. And I was just looking at one of those examples that comes to my mind is this concept called Global Handwashing Day. And it's particularly relevant now because of COVID. Right. Yeah. So Global Handwashing Day was actually originally created by an agency out of London but it's a UN recognized day for October the 15th now. Really? And it was actually part of the thing combined with Colgate and UNICEF, uh, Colgate, UNICEF and uh, uh, Unilever. Okay. Because for them, it was important to actually address the whole category of soap. So it benefits them, but it also does good. Yeah. And so therefore there's no owner of global hand washing day. It's just a recognized day. It's a little bit like the AIDS ribbon. Who owns that? Yeah, but but then it's I would say based on the discussion we're having, it's almost impossible to have that to have a business around that because there's no money to be made because everybody owns everything. But the money may not be made specifically from the open source brand. Your money may be an indirect beneficiary of it. So let's say Global Hand Washing Day, I'm just playing yeah. devil's advocate, is genuinely adopted by an additional 100 million people because yeah. it resonates with them. These 100 million people are going to wash their hands with soap and they're going to get that soap from somewhere. And that's going to be... Oh, so indirectly you can build uh, a business around it, but but you don't... Well, you can argue. I mean, I, I haven't found enough examples to say that you can make money off an open source brand because as soon as you do that, you spoil the ethos of the brand. Yeah, because and, at and the end the, of the day, it's kind of like you're not doing it to make money. You're doing it to further a cause. To further the, reason, a the, reason. the reason I'm saying the reason I'm so focused on the money part is because obviously if you want to create a change, you need funding to do that change. And the more funding, the more impact you can do globally. Um, which is why it was so interesting to hear an open source brand concept, which I've never heard before. Um, well, I, I've, I guess I've heard of it, I just never interpreted it that way. But I guess if you do things indirectly um, that help further that cause, but don't specifically are needed, just make it nicer. It's kind of, if I, I play video games, so if, if it's like you can play the video game or you can pay like five bucks and then have a lot of extra stuff so that you can uh, enjoy your travels a little bit better. So it's kind of like that. Like if you if you build a business around uh, the washing stuff, right. you w then Unilever selling soap, you know, it makes it easier to wash your hands with their soap. I mean, you can make your own soap, but, you know, we prefer yeah, not but to. that does but also other category players will benefit so you know a procter and gamble or a record ben Keyser will also benefit because their soaps will also sell around global hand washing day nobody owns that but it's good ultimately it has a benefit to society wherever you are so then on the primary it benefits people and on the secondary it benefits local economies and sometimes but the downside is, and it's the reason why this wouldn't apply to a for-profit business, you have no control over what it benefits, which is why it's perfect for a non-profit and not very good for a for-profit, I can imagine. Well, I, I think the first part of what you said, uh, Lova, I would agree that, uh, you know, that, it's, that the primary benefit is for the cause and the secondary benefit could be for the economy and the business. Um, but I think that... It's, um, I, I don't know whether the, you know, whether the business does not benefit. I mean, there is a direct, there is a benefit that accrues. It's just that it's not because of the, 
you know, not because of that uh, non-profit, uh, open source brand. It's as a so, result of the effect of it. Yeah. It's generally interesting because I've like not really been in that industry. I've worked on low level for like a, a UNICEF or something like that in my early, early jobs. Um, but I've never been on a high level or something. So, so it's so interesting to draw the parallels of how thinking and doing business is so much different in the nonprofit environment. Right. Um, yeah, that's true. Isn't it? Are you, Well, you took eventually like 11 years or something like that. Did you eventually get used to that uh, way of thinking? With You mean in WWF? Or? WWF, yes. Yes. Uh, I think that you, you know, it's, I'm still getting used to it. <laughs> I suppose nobody really gets completely used to it, but it's complex because the externalities continue to change, right? And so you have, you know, you have the UN bodies who you need to deal with, you have local governments who you need to deal with, you have businesses that you need to deal with. But at the same time, few things change, right? Technologies change. So suddenly when you're talking about climate change, you know, the, the way renewable energy or the way a Tesla works, has a direct impact and that is coming in from the outside. So you need to be able to adapt to say, okay, are the policies for electric vehicles well embedded in EU law or in country law? You know, where does it sit with respect? Because that technology is now available. You know, does wind technology get its, its fair share of subsidy to allow it to take off? So those are externalities. Then you've got political externalities. So you could go from a, uh, you know, a changing administration in the White House from the previous administration to the current one, which has a different view on the environment. And, you know, you can argue whether one is right or one is wrong, but there's definite difference. And but how, do you, are... how do you deal with that? Because obviously Trump is not popular to follow science. Uh, and I can imagine that directly impacts the WWF, no? Well, I think it directly impacts uh, environmental policy. And I think that the role of the NGO is to be able to call, call out administrations that are not benefiting environmental policy and make it known and help people to understand what's changing. And then, you know, people need to make their voices heard because ultimately people vote and people elect and, and therefore people can put this into their agenda or not. And now that's a different dialogue as to, you know, what is the role of the environment in people's agenda today? Because today you're in a situation where you're coming out of COVID. Everybody's intention is going to be around staying healthy and firing up the economy. Now, does it mean that we're going to do this at the detriment of the environment or we're going to do this in a new way, benefiting the environment? I don't know the answer as yet. So for me to understand because I'm realizing a lot of things which I can imagine listeners as well. Um, maybe not everybody, but for me at least. Um, WWF isn't specifically like an organization that is going to make the change. The organization is there to point out when things are going wrong and, and give solutions so that others can make the change. Yes, so you suggest solutions. Because remember, the ultimate change for anything ultimately happens at the point of either a corporate in terms of the change of their behavior or the change of their sourcing or of a government in, in where they may legislate differently or an institution like a financial or a multilateral institution where they enshrine a new policy, right? Yeah. So that change actually takes place at a different point. An NGO is not in a position to make the change. An NGO is in the position to bear witness and to facilitate or to suggest or to push or to nudge towards a change. That is and so to nice. use science wherever they can. You know, So you're using facts rather than just opinions. So what were you... Well, what were you exactly then doing throughout the, the 10, 11 years? You, you mentioned the campaign that you ran, but what does your day to day look like then? So the day to day would actually work around 
what are the big issues that we were dealing with? So, you know, for example, till 2020, and a lot of 2020 is now in 2021, you know, the big <laughs> meeting. So yeah. 2021 is the new 2020, right? Yeah, so, I heard. you know, what are those issues that we need to get to in 2020 that is going to define the policies and the frameworks for the next decade? That's important for the world. Right. So whether it's policies around climate, whether it's around the SDGs, whether it's around um, nature and biodiversity, all of those frameworks are going through various checks and, and balances between 2020 and 2030. So our role over these last few years leading into this, I'm just giving you a snapshot, was really linked to how do we ensure that we get a fair crack at the policy change between 20 and 2030 so that when we emerge in 2030 we are in a better place than where we, where we are today so so most of the big ngos like the unicefs and the wwf and all these things i guess what i'm realizing then is they are focused very much on adopting the policy part of it uh, and so you as a marketeer then are going to gather data, research, uh, and then create market segmentation to, on one end, influence the politicians of every country, but also the people so that it kind of comes from both sides towards the politicians. You could go into that job straight away. <laughs> well, I, I imagine that's probably what took you two or three years to figure out. That's exactly right. Well, because... you got it very quickly. That's remarkable because it took me a long time to figure well, it out. Well, I got the concept of it, but the reason it's taking me a while to grasp it is because I don't know how I would go from a for-profit um, running my company, thinking about, um, you know, oxygen sales, we need to grow our team, investors, and then suddenly this shift to open source branding, movements, influencing politicians, which is, it sounds almost like becoming a politician um, with obviously the skills of an entrepreneur or in your case, marketeer and entrepreneur. That, yeah, that... No, no, that's a, that's a really good encapsulation of the task at hand. Do you have an example story of like the biggest thing you did where you thought like, okay, this is how I pretty much set my impact? Well, I mean, I would just use just to stay with it rather than complicate matters is to stay with Earth Hour. And, and I think that what, what many people may not know is that because we amass millions and hundreds of millions of people around Earth Hour, is that we have now been able to use the people power around Earth Hour to impact as many as I would say in the last five to seven years, maybe 15 to 20 laws. That wow. means we are able to, because of the number of people coming forward from Russia to Argentina at a country level, to sign a petition for a particular law that can then get introduced into parliament because you have met the basic numbers. And then, you know, the NGO community pushes that, that law, the, that bill, you then end up getting it into law. But Earth Hour plays a trigger role in bringing the people power in harnessing that to be able to put it forward in the first place. And, and I, that's something that I'm genuinely proud about, that, you know, that we were able to bring people together for, us, for the agenda that was important to them in their country and say, if, if solar energy is important to you, you know, in your country, let's say in Nepal, then push for the change that you want around solar. Because if it wasn't, they wouldn't push for it. Right. As a, as a global marketeer then, especially looking at the Earth Hour project, um, I can imagine you had more resources than just budgets because are budgets big in NGOs? No. No. Budgets but... are not necessary. But, uh, you know, budgets are never big. Budgets are never enough. Let's just put it this way. Budgets are never enough, whether you're in a corporate or in an NGO, Right. I think but then, I'm, but I, in an NGO, you have outside of the budget also the resources of probably having volunteers, um, advocates, local yes. organizations. So you do have different kinds of resources that that come to bear, and that you know we are obviously quite grateful grateful for. But you know, creativity never came from big budgets, right? 
And, and I think that people are forced to get really creative when your resources are, are limited or constrained. And I think in every country, every single year, the communicators and the marketeers used to just execute magic because they used to just make stuff happen that you couldn't even imagine. And then particularly around Earth Hour, they would mobilize the whole country. Ministers would show up at events. Every, every country that I've been to during Earth Hour, I, I've not been to a single event where there hasn't been a high-ranking minister on show because you're in, in involving such a large section of society, there is no way that the politicians and the legislators can ignore it. And I think that that's the strength of people power. It's not about us. It's not about WWF. It's about the people that they're coming there because there is a, a calling from the ground. So uh, isn't then the purpose for also from your position on you have Earth Hour, uh, isn't like the purpose to make maybe an Earth Week or maybe have different types of concepts like, you know, a washing day, a environment day, a turn off electricity day. I can imagine from a WWF perspective, that would give you a lot of leverage to introduce even more laws. Well, they, you know, there are a lot of events around the world and a lot of designated days. And there are many days that we support. We don't have to own them. We don't have to start them. So, you know, there's World Environment Day in June and, you know, the, the world, uh, the UN operates that and the UN endorses that. And we participate in that. That's a big day that everybody sort of jumps on to. And, and uh, collectively, big things happen. There's Earth Day that happens in April. And, you know, so there's all of these various days. And, and for Earth Hour, we say, OK, let's not get, uh, you know, let's let's uh, uh, let's uh, recognize the significance of hundreds of millions of people, maybe billions of people donating an hour of their thinking towards the environment. How powerful is that? Let's maximize that. So we don't always have to create new stuff. We need, we, we need to work with others on the stuff that exists. We want them to work with us on things that we may have created. Yeah. Uh, but I think that there's a lot. And yes, there'll always be new things that's, that are created. You're right. I just think that with limited resources, I would be cautious or I would tell my uh, successor to be cautious in terms of choosing what they want to pursue and what what about um so obviously in an ngo space from obviously i mean startup so more practical or scale up whatever you call my company at this point um and then here it becomes very politiciany uh, a lot of uh, stakeholders i can imagine if you take the practical and the impractical you would have something like an investment fund from the wwf that would invest in environmental disruptive technologies that can also bring profit for WWF to, and also because WWF is so big, they could take those technologies and pretty much spread them all over the world really fast. Um, how come, does the WWF have an investment fund? Like, Well, I mean, it is a fund. The WWF is the worldwide fund for nature. So it is a fund and many people forget that. Yeah. But that, that fund is in order to be able to make the necessary grants into the right places for the, for the environmental agenda. Our donors have provided those funds in order to impact certain environmental challenges. So that's so, really where we put our, our funding and our grants. But isn't disruptive potential startup technologies a practical way to accomplish those things? Because sure. let's I, let's I, take I an Uber. Right. Yeah, I mean, let's take an Uber. Uh, and by the time the lawmakers caught up with what happened with Uber, they were already like, I don't know, five or 10 years old. So what if the WWF, you know, had an environment startup that, I don't know, made the, the environment suddenly drop the temperature so that we can, you know, save ourselves or something like that wouldn't that be a good investment entirely i think that it needs to have the right source of investment for the wwf to be able to make that remember the money that wwf works with is donor money 
So we have to be very respectful of for the reason that it was given to us and therefore how it's then deployed and how it's governed. So, so if somebody was giving are... it to you for that reason, yes. But if you were being given to a, given the money for a different reason, it's difficult to divert it. Ah, uh, but th so that is the limitation of an of a NGO. We, you can't just do crazy stuff like in a startup environment that could potentially have a thousand x uh, upside. That's correct, because in a in a startup, you're only you know your once you raise the money. But even in a startup, you have a certain uh, you know you have a certain mandate. Uh, your investor is putting in a certain investment for a particular purpose. And the board or the investor needs to sign off if you're going to deviate from that purpose. Yeah, yeah. Except, yeah, it's a little bit more flexible than, than donor money. That's what I'm understanding. That's right. Exactly. That's crazy. Wow. Wow. That's a long conversation. So much to talk about, of course. I don't want to take more of your time, but I do want to ask you uh, from the, the entire story from beginning ads to eventually using uh, your powers for good. Um, what is like the main learning lesson you would take away, um, give to listeners, startups, business owners, investors, whatever, who's listening? Well, wow, that's a big one. I, I think that, you know, having worked in the corporate sector as an entrepreneur and in an NGO, I think the one thing that I, I have come to uh, recognize is that I would ask business owners and business managers to be responsible and ethical in their business operations because ultimately, you know, while profits are important, it should not come at the cost of, of other things that they do not price in to their to their efforts right and i think that there is a moral responsibility on business owners to be mindful of the social and environmental impact that they're having uh, so more than them being neutral they should be looking to see how can they be positive yeah. and i think that that is a really important uh, aspect i think the second is that i would tell you know younger people who are in the earlier stages of their career is that it's really, you know, people don't need to choose one career. I think in today's world, and I, I not even from today's world, I'm going back 30 years, but I, if I could have a non-linear career, so can they. And I think that you need to identify and extract and build those strengths that are then transferable across. I mean, there's nothing wrong in working in one industry your entire life if that's what you want but you don't have to feel that that's the only way to do it. And I think that you as an entrepreneur will probably also relate to that. And I think that the third is for the NGO sector. Uh, I think that, you know, from like the examples you were giving, I think that the NGO sector needs to find ways to become more entrepreneurial because there are, you know, what's going to be the next stage of, of the donor model? Is it going to be impact investing? Is it going to be the social enterprise? You know, and I think that these are examples that don't, I mean, again, going back to the same principle, why are they having to be created by boutique shops outside of the sphere? Why are NGOs not experimenting with that? Because that, there is going to be an evolution and they need to be able to be part of that evolution. Uh, and otherwise you just get left behind. So I think that there's a constant change happening and, um, and there's, there's just so much to learn. I mean, there isn't, you know, one lifetime ain't enough. True. As you were saying that, I was also thinking NGOs can also invest without money uh, because they have the exposure, the reach and everything to, to make. I mean, some of our startups that one were environmentally uh, very influential within the Netherlands and hopefully now scaling. So, yeah, so much to unpack. But I do think that's probably for a next podcast, if you'll still have me. But um, last question I have is what books are you reading currently? Anything to recommend? Right. OK, so a couple of couple of books that I'm reading right now, one of them is the 
is, is no surprise, a, a mathematical based book. It's called the, the Hidden Half, What the Numbers Don't Tell You. And this is written by a gentleman called Michael Blastland. It's a very interesting book. Uh, and he's a mathematician. I think he's at the University of Cambridge, if I've got it right. Um, and that's one. Uh, there's a second um, book, which I'm just beginning to read now. It's called New Waves. And uh, I'll, you'll have to forgive me. I don't remember the author, but it actually talks about how biases are built into the programming of algorithms. And oh, wow. it's written as a fiction story, but the, the, the issues in it are real. It's a fascinating uh, and frightening book. And uh, I would uh, really want to learn more about that. I learned about AI and ethics when I did a course on it last year. Uh, and I'm really intrigued about the whole programming of ethics into artificial intelligence. Is that the future of your career, you think? You're going to go into AI and stuff? I, I, would, uh, I would love to. Uh, if I have the chops for it and the right opportunity, yes. Nice. Okay, I think that's a great way to stop uh, the episode. I'm super grateful that you came out. And uh, I'm pretty sure that we'll uh, have you on in the future as well, because it was really interesting and everything you've experienced. Thank Thanks you. For sharing. Very appreciative. And thank you to all your listeners as well. If you like this episode, you can check out our most recent one here. And if you haven't already, make sure you click here to subscribe and see the next one. But if you're interested in more tips and tricks, then make sure to join our Facebook group where you can find thousands of like-minded people and you get direct access and support to any business question from the entire startup funding event team.